Well, Charles, how are you? Welcome. Happy Sunday. It's great to be on, and it's great to be on with our special guests. We have Judge yes. Janine. Absolutely amazing guests today. We've got Judge Janine Pirro with us. Hello, Judge. Hi, guys. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So, Judge, it's been quite a week for you. You have your new book out, and uh, you were on The View, as everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. Yes, it has been quite a week. You know, I went on The View. Uh, I was asked by them to go on The View to talk about my book. And, uh, you know, we did the first segment. It was, it, was, it was okay. And then we came back after the break, and the wheels fell off the wagon. <laughs> but as I said last night on my show, you know, I'm, I'm moving on from it. It, was, uh, it wasn't uh, a nice thing to experience. And I spoke about it last night on my show, Justice. You know, that, it, that the left is, you know, determined to shut down the right, and we've seen it with the Antifa, we've seen it uh, at universities, and, uh, you know, my intent was to go on and talk about my book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, but I guess they wanted to talk about other stuff. <laughs> right. Right. You made quite an impact, uh, Judge, and I'll tell you what, I go, um, I'm not going to reveal where I live exactly, but I go to this Starbucks around the corner from where I live that's, you know, it's, I'm like the only conservative in the, in the Starbucks. And this one guy came up to me once and said, excuse me, because he heard me on the phone, are you by chance a conservative? And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and it turns out he's another conservative. And this guy is a neurologist. And we were talking about you this morning. He said, you know, it's his medical opinion that these, this is a serious sanity issue. It's not just, you know, uh, a, a debate. These people are exhibiting signs of actual insanity. Yeah, well, it's called the Trump derangement syndrome, and I think that you can tell if someone suffers from it if they have a breakdown as soon as you say those words. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the sad part about all of this, guys, is that, you know, uh, the 45th president of the United States was duly elected by the people of this country, and uh, the, to have to deal with this on a daily basis, to take the incoming every day, uh, and for his supporters to be called every name in the book and take incoming, as I do on a regular basis, which is fine. Um, it, you know, it, this is not America. And as I said last night, they are literally, you know, robbing us of what it is that makes us great. And that is to be a country where you can say whatever you want. And, it, you know, people will respect your uh, position and there'll be a dialogue. Not anymore. Uh, and someone said to me, you know, you triggered uh, uh, someone when, when I used Trump derangement syndrome. And I said, are you serious? Is this triggering? Is that like a justification for flipping out? If I say something, someone could flip out and throw me out and curse at me and tell me to get the F out of the building? I mean, I've just never been treated like that in my life. Well, and you know, one thing, I don't know you very well, Judge, but I've read up on your bio, and you know, you contrast Whoopi Goldberg, who just to be charitable is a comedian, and I won't go into further into her background, let's just say she's a comedian, and then you look at your work, which until I prepared for this interview, I didn't know of your long career, the specifics, that you were one of the first persons to set up an anti-child trafficking serious approach, uh, anti-sex trafficking uh, targeting ch children. Uh, in this country, and you know that's a very important, odious set of crimes. You contrast that work that you've done. You write about it in your book um, with Hillary Clinton, who goes around now dressed like a bag lady, <laughs> arguing that you know that she, sh you know, she spent her whole life ha trying to help children. In what way? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, and I got to tell you, Charles, and I, and I do appreciate the compliment, and I thank you. But the truth is, I, I, I have devoted, you know, my professional life before television to uh, trying to level the playing field. Uh, victims for too long have been silenced, not just by their abusers, but by the system. And, and I, I, I've often said, and actually wrote a book about this, that it shouldn't be called the criminal justice system, it should be called the victim's justice system. Because the victim is the one who's entitled to justice. The victim is the one who never chose to be victimized by a criminal in the first place. 
Uh, and and so for me, you know, I started the first domestic violence unit in the nation, uh, and I was one of the first in the country to actually prosecute child abuse cases and demand that social services give me reports that they would expunge as soon as a social service uh, individual felt the case was resolved. I wanted those reports, guys, because I knew that if a child um, had been abused and I then get the case as a homicide, uh, you know, a time later, I should be entitled to get the history of the prior bad acts. And I had a real war on my hands to get those incidents. So, I mean, I've spent my life in the, in the trenches, on the battlefield, where the fight between good and evil unfolds, and never ever did I think about politics on my show, Justice. But there are more criminals in Washington than there are being tried in criminal courts across this country. Well, it's absolutely astounding. And of course, Judge Janine's book, which is now the number one bestseller, so perhaps we should thank Whoopi Goldberg, it's called Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. And my confusion is that you seem to be talking about the same people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it, you know, I, I decided to write the book because I felt that it was important to put the facts behind all of the lunacy that's going on. Um, and the book is an easy read, guys. It's a very easy read. And, you know, it is copiously footnoted so that if anybody, you know, is trying to have a conversation with someone and, you know, you don't have the, uh, and they say you don't know what you're talking about, the book has all the, the footnotes. But, but what I wanted to do in the book was identify, you know, the liars, the leakers, and the liberals. And, and many times, one person can be the same. But it, we are living in a time of tremendous fracture in this country because uh, a, 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 a cabal at the top of the FBI made a decision to, uh, you know, drag a flawed or try to drag a flawed candidate against a, a, across the presidential finish line and then uh, to tee up an investigation of Russia collusion as an insurance policy, as Peter Strzok put it, in the event, God forbid, the man should be elected. I mean, these documents are as, as, as open and as clear as, uh, you know, the, the, the day is long. Um, or at least 24 hours, that's clear. Uh, and in the end, uh, people have lost faith in the most important system in our country, and that is our system of justice. So shame on the James Comeys, the Peter Strucks, the Loretta Lynches, you know, where their bias is so clear and so acted upon, spoken about, lied about, that, you know, this president takes incoming every day. And, you know, it's like he said to me, he said, you know, and I've known him for 30 years, guys, and he said to me, you know, Janine, I didn't sign up for this. Uh, now, I signed up for this. Uh, forgive me. My kids didn't sign up for this. And here's a guy who can, you know, he's the kind of guy who can go into a lion's den uh, and come out with his suit and tie straight and, you know, a lion's head to put on the wall somewhere in his, in his library. I mean, he is a force of nature. He rarely sleeps. He doesn't stop. And he's been, you know, and, and he's been a success. There is not one metric in this country that is worse off under Donald Trump. I mean, unemployment, the economy, you know, the animal spirits there, um, as well as the GDP, they're going to knock it out of the park. Uh, and, the, you know, ISIS, is, the caliphate is, is, is dissolved. And if you think about it, the other guy couldn't figure out whether to, you know, uh, destroy it, dismantle it. He didn't know what to do. And then this nonsense about Russia and Putin, you know, the president needs to be charged with treason or impeached. You know, as my friend Trey Gowdy said uh, on, on the news today, he said, you know, it's a death penalty crime. And both Trey and I have tried death penalty cases. Uh, it's serious stuff. And they just hate. And if we don't get a handle on this, we're going to be in big, big trouble. We cannot allow the left, the George Soros's of the world, uh, to try to change the nation that our founding fathers created. Couldn't agree more, Judge. I've got one question for you. Why in the yeah. heck is President Trump allowing Rod Rosenstein to remain in his job? I don't get that. Hmm. 
Have we got you there, Judge? We're losing you, Judge Janine. Um, I'm not moving. I think we got a cordless phone that's possibly losing battery. Um, there we go. You're so. back. You're back. No, can you hear me now? Is this yeah, any better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, uh, I'm standing near a window. Look, um, I think we all understand that the president is furious about uh, 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 Jeff Sessions. I mean, you know, the guy's been in the closet since he got sworn in as attorney general. He's, and the president is upset because this guy decided that within 24 hours he'd recuse himself from everything 2016 related, and it automatically catapulted uh, this guy, Rod Rosenstein, uh, to be the attorney general. And Rod Rosenstein is the guy who prosecuted the Russians who were trying to access our uranium, or at least bribed their way into the most uh, you know, powerful people they could find to access the United States' uranium for Russia. And, of course, they found fertile ground in, uh, with the Clintons. And, uh, you know, they take a plea bargain on the case. Rosenstein allowed the case to be decided outside of the guidelines, sentenced outside of the guidelines, you know, quietly. No, no bells and whistles or trumpets on Russia, you know, uh, meddling in our uranium. Uh, and this is the guy now who's pals with Comey. He's pals with Bob Mueller. He's the one who appoints Mueller as a special counsel. I mean, this is this is a click. You remember clicks in high school? Well, that's what these guys are. And their attitude is that they know better than we, which is so typical uh, of the left. It's so typical of those who are condescending, sanctimonious. You know, you Americans are too dumb to know what's good for you. You cling to God, religion, and your guns. Shame on you. You're all deplorable idiots. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, as I say in my book, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, you know, I, I'm guilty. I plead guilty and guilty and proud. But um, if we don't do something in 2018, guys, if we don't uh, make it clear to the Soros-funded groups and to those individuals who want socialism in this country, who don't think that capitalism is a good thing, if we don't continue on the road that Donald Trump has started, then you know what? We're going to be no better than a third world country. I agree, Judge. And, you know, thanks so much for having me on to talk about the Clinton Foundation. I mean, one area where we can make some progress in 2018 is if we highlight the various candidates who are running for attorney general, senator, governor, et cetera. What are their views on charity fraud? There's, you know, there are many bad crimes, but charity fraud is right up there. It's a serious crime. The Trump stand accused of it. What they're accused of is nothing like what the Clintons are doing right now. What can we do to raise the pressure on that? Well, first of all, I mean, and let me give kudos to you, uh, Charles, because, I mean, when I need to understand something, uh, it's Charles Ortel that I called to try to get some insight into things that are too complicated for me uh, in terms of the, the numbers and, and what's going on with that foundation. Look, I've said many times, the, the Clinton Foundation is nothing more than an organized criminal enterprise. It was set up uh, to collect money for the Clintons, and when she became the Secretary of State, the personal server was the mechanism that they would use to uh, identify monies and then put monies into the foundation, use the government department uh, to access and to pay back uh, for money, just like the sale of 20% of our uranium uh, to Russia, $145 million payback uh, to the foundation and 500000 quick cash to bill for a 20-minute speech in Russia. But, um, you know, the amazing thing, and Charles, it may have been you who told me this, uh, that, that the person who gave the approval to the Clinton Global Initiative in 2009 uh, was that infamous Lois Lerner. You know, the woman who was so afraid of uh, testifying before Congress that she took the Fifth Amendment, of course, after she, you know, expressed her case, which is un unacceptable. She waived it, but that's another issue. Uh, you know, Lois Lerner is the one who tried to stop the conservatives from getting their 501c3 status. And here she is, you know, waving through the Clinton Global Initiative that hasn't really, along with the foundation, gotten a real, you know, forensic 
uh, analysis by any objective uh, parties. I mean, it, it is it is very sad. It's it's not even frustrating anymore. It's sad. This stuff is happening in front of us. It's like when Donald Trump got elected, the veil got dropped. We see the text messages, the emails. We see that, you know, there is you know, no obstruction, that you know, Rod Rosenstein told the president to fire Comey in a letter, and then Comey, and then and Comey's fired by the president, and who's the guy in charge of, uh, uh, of the investigation? Rod Rosenstein is in charge of the investigation to see if the president obstructed uh, uh, justice by firing uh, Jim Comey. I mean, it's all backwards, upside down, inside out. And that's why I wrote the book. I want to make it simple. I want people to understand what's at stake. And I want them also to realize that this country is precious. And the dark forces that we are seeing in significant areas where people within the justice uh, 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 division, not just department, but the division of justice are trying to influence politics. It's usually the politicians who try to influence justice. Now it's just the opposite. And this is what happens in third world countries. You cannot disenfranchise the, the, the hundreds of millions of Americans uh, who voted, or the millions of Americans anyway, who voted for Donald Trump. And the hate is serious, and we've got to push back. And the way to do that is in 2018. You know, Judge, so many of our viewers were shocked on July 3rd when Imran Awan was given this plea arrangement whereby he cannot be charged for any nonviolent crime at all in his life up to July 3rd, 2018, because he's pled guilty to a financial crime of mortgage fraud. Have you in your career ever seen anything like that? I have never seen anything like that, nor have I ever seen a, uh, uh, an individual who cooperated with the FBI as a confidential informant, a businessman, who went to the FBI to say the Russians are, are trying to bribe their way to buy our uranium. I've never seen anyone like that gagged after the case was over, long over, and told that if he even talked about the case, he would be sent to jail. These people are, are bad people. And, you know, Jim Comey lying before Congress, uh, 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 Hillary Clinton, I mean, forget about the, the Clinton Foundation and, and, and the, uh, the money that they're pocketing. What about the fact that, you know, she had all those secrets on her uh, personal email that were, according to uh, the hacker Guccifer, as open as an orchid, and yet we send a sailor who took a picture of a submarine to prison for, you know, violating uh, uh, classified uh, uh, documents law. It's I mean, really I used to, I tried cases, I've been a prosecutor, a judge, and a DA for 30 years, I've run for office five times, and one of the things that I always said was, no one is above the law and no one is below it. Well, I'm sorry to say it, but this last election makes it eminently clear that the Justice Department and the FBI, that didn't even bother to impanel a grand jury, issue a search warrant, subpoenas, handed out immunity like they were, like it was a cat lollipop, <laughs> they're not interested in us and the American people. But the American people instinctively got it, and that's why they elected Donald Trump. They knew that something was wrong in, uh, in Washington. They knew that their interests were not being looked after. Absolutely. I know, and our, our viewers and our friends, you know, are really grateful to you and especially to the president. Um, we're going to encourage our viewers to go out if they already haven't done it and get multiple copies of your book, one to read for themselves, others to give away as gifts. Uh, if you, I know you're in touch with the president from time to time. Please tell him that you know there are people actually who live in Chelsea and in the West Village in New York, strange areas, who are very much appreciative of the fact not only that he's working as hard as he is, but he's doing it for free. <laughs> ain't that a ain't that a turnaround, guys? In fact, I will see him tomorrow, so I will definitely tell him that. 
And uh, I very much appreciate um, your promoting my book. Uh, it is, uh, it is a, it was a labor of love. It was hard for me because my whole life I've been a believer, guys. I believe in Lady Justice, and I believe she's blind. And it's the way I ran my office when I was a sitting DA. You know, we prosecuted close to 40,000 cases every year. Wow. And we did it without fear or favor. And I am devastated by what happened in the last election. So uh, thanks so much for promoting Liars, Leakers, and Liberals. And, Charles, I look forward to talking to you again, getting you on the show, uh, because you are a brilliant mind uh, and certainly more brilliant than me when it comes to anything that has a number in front of it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, enjoy your Sunday, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Janine. Do you have one second for a quick last question? That sounds like she's gone. Okay. Well, thank you, Judge Janine, for joining us. I wanted to ask her, Charles, if we could, about these persistent rumors regarding uh, Tony Podesta being offered immunity for testifying against Paul Manafort. It's being reported by a number of outlets, so it's unclear to me if that is accurate or not. And uh, we've we've heard it all over the place. So. Well, well, He's been awfully quiet, and we didn't get a chance, Fabian, to give you a proper introduction. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you so much. I Uh, just want to make sure we've got the judge removed. Okay, and there we go. So let me bring... I'm seeing Jason now. Yes. The only issue, Fabian, is that... let Let me call you right back. It'll take just one second, Fabian. Okay. Thank you. I just don't want any remnants of the judge's call to be visible on there. So let's just get Fabian on a clear line. Uh, Well, Charles, that was very exciting to have Judge Janine on the program. Thank you so much for facilitating that. And it's equally exciting to have Fabian back with us. He's one of our all-time favorite guests known to crowdsource, Crowdsource the Truth users as the Pinko Panther, uh, or the, sorry, the inspector who has helped us locate the Pinko Panthers. Fabian, hello, bonjour, como ça va? Hello, hello Jason, hello Charles. Hello Fabian. I'm called Inspector Cluso, that's my nickname for Charles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us again. So perhaps, uh, Jason, if we could go to the title page. Yes. And we're just going to quickly get into the uh, First, we want to compliment the art department. What we're uh, talking about, I guess we're skipping the compliments. Sorry. (laughs) This is a a complicated uh, show today. (laughs) So, um, Fabian, just in case you don't know, Chicago is a famous musical. uh, And here we have one character. Have you still got us? Repeat again. No. Charles, can you repeat? Sure, sure. Because it cut. 30 seconds ago. Okay, so, sure. So uh, you may not know the, uh, the movie Chicago, uh, but nope. yeah, so this is a famous movie. Here the art department has labored through the night to uh, superimpose Barack Obama's uh, head on top of Richard Gere's body and Valerie Jarrett. And That's an insult to Richard Gere. But. <laughs> it is, <laughs> and Hillary Clinton. But the reason we thought of doing this particular poster is that what's going on here um, is not as simple as Comey and Mueller and Rosenstein being the problem. This scandal, I think many months ago, reached a point where those of us who follow details, and Fabian is one of the most detailed expert analysts, not simply of politics, but of economics, investments around the world. He and I are in daily contact constantly. but you know, he appreciates that this is a conspiracy. What happened in 2015 and 2016 is, is not even the final chapter, it's an end chapter in a conspiracy that began, I would argue, sometime by 2008, where the Clintons agreed to stand down and cooperate with the Obama team in exchange for being able to let their foundation run riot and then get, and, and seeding the opportunity for Hillary Clinton, in theory, to take over from Barack Obama in 2017. This is not something that happened by accident in 2016, all this whole story. And our mainstream journalists 
don't really have the patience that Fabian, you and I have, to go back into all the muck and detail and to see what really motivated the, uh, Barack Obama, his people, and his backers to try this audacious scheme to insert in, in, someone really without that much in the way of specific accomplishment. If you go into Barack Obama's history prior to uh, becoming President of the United States, the, the, the best thing that he managed was his campaign, presidential campaign. I mean, that, you could say, came off without a hitch. Actually, it was pretty well run, the whole thing. But before that, he had never had a piece of major legislation across the line. He had an undistinguished career as a state senator in Illinois. And before that, you know, we don't really even know what he ever did. Community organizing? Community, I mean, we just, you know, there's so many question marks over his background. And he, he then plucks from obscurity this Valerie Jarrett, who some, you know, cynics argued she was the one who was the real president when Barack Obama was living in the White House. She was the one pulling the strings, wow. interacting with all the donors, uh, and pushing this hard left, anti-capitalist, pro-Iranian mayhem uh, set of policies, which certainly got put in place in those eight yeah. years. And the whole idea was to then, in a corrupt fashion, turn around and install Hillary Clinton so that she could continue the path, the destructive path set by these two, and cover up the crimes. But guess what? That didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, when, when, Charles, when you say uh, the sets of events that uh, motivated Mr. Obama in 2008, do you mean motivated or compelled or obligated? Because that's the issue, I think. Yeah, uh, w why don't you elaborate? I'm not sure where you're going with that. Well, you know, uh, for Mr. Obama to work hand in hand with the Clintons, and providing the kind of agreement that secured uh, the operations of the Clinton Foundation outside of the law how, in the way that has now been discovered, um, and to even operate the State Department without an inspector general, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's quite shocking, uh, you know, the Clinton must have had an edge right. on well, Mr. Obama, one way or the other, I mean, because it doesn't, otherwise it's there's a piece which is missing. We, we have a whole slide on that, Femia, coming up. We'll get back into that in a second. We're going to go in great depth through 2008, line by line. If we could go to the next uh, slide. We like to have, this is for people who are trying to organize. We now, I guess, have, what is it, 88 or 89 of these, a large number of them. And so we like to, to do every cover the same way so that it, you can get a sense of what we're talking about what this presentation is all about. We're going to spend some serious time on these details here today. But what we have is, is, a, is a, uh, a monumental battle, as Judge Janine started to explain, between these, the globalist mob, you know, the Soroses, the Clintons, the Obamas, the globalists around the world, the Davos men and women, you know, who are out to subvert and subject and, and um, get the, uh, the, the, the nationalists in countries like the United States and France to abandon nationalist governments, to surrender our authority, to surrender our property to these unelected globalists who want to take your property, tax you into the poorhouse basically, dictate what it is that you're going to do as they pursue these grand plans that, oh, by the way, just happen to enrich the globalists who are promoting all this. And you know, Donald Trump correctly perceived that. There are some uh, politicians in other countries around the world who are seeing the same thing. France hasn't yet, I don't think, cottoned on to this. Germany hasn't yet. England has, elements in England have. And so we're at a moment here in the United States, a, a pivotal moment coming into this election, as Janine started to talk about, where Rosenstein and Mueller and maybe Sessions and others are seriously trying to continue with this, this soft coup or hard coup attempt to, to, as it were, trump up charges against the president, you know, and whip the media, whip the mob into a frenzy and, and, and hope that they can displace uh, the Republicans in the House and the Senate and then impeach Donald Trump, convict him, and bring back Mother Hillary. Every time I think they're done, they just, they won't give up. They're like a bad horror movie. Yeah, it's like the Terminator, you know, he's in the pile of garbage on fire, just right. a skeleton keeps coming back. So if we could go quickly to the next page, this is our standard um, 
uh, disclaimer, but we like to repeat it every time because we have a lot of international uh, viewers actually now that don't have the protection in their countries of, of, of the First Amendment. We do have a First Amendment right in this country. We're broadcasting here from the United States, albeit from New Yorkistan. Um, and <laughs> we like to point out that our approach is to lay out facts and evidence, give you a chance. To, you know, we express our views. We'll have a conversation in a few minutes, a, a lengthy conversation. But our, our views are grounded in, in facts. And to the extent we have a disagreement, we can point to evidence that says, you know, consider this or consider that. Um, so we just went through, if we'll jump, well, well maybe there, we have put up uh, Judge Janine's Twitter account, and we've put Fabian, your Twitter account, we want to get you, you, your Twitter followers need to rise, and we're going to try to help you do that, because uh, Fabian has begun to uh, tweet more actively himself, he has a unique perspective. Uh, I would encourage our crowdsource the truthers to uh, Definitely follow Fabien. Um, and in, a, in addition, uh, we might just put up the playlist quickly after you get Fabien. Uh, yeah. Um, Jason has done a remarkable job putting up all of these. He, not only does he do our videos, but, but he has many, many other videos that he does. He's organized them all very well. Um, I guess, Jason, we've got, what, what do we have now? Uh, I think it's, uh, this is going to be the 89th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 89th. It's quite a few videos, Charles. Right, and we have now people, 10,000, more than 10,000 people have viewed just this index. The playlist, right. The playlist. Yeah. Not to mention the millions who've actually gone and read this body of work, which, you know, we knew in the beginning that this was a big topic and that we had to do it this way. We had to break it up into two-hour videos because, I mean, you, you can't ask somebody to, like, go into a room and watch something for a week. Oh, it's like the Godfather Part 6. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, I just we are, uh, you know, making steady progress. And uh, Yes, Fabian. Can I just interject? Uh, Please. Maybe you should tell the viewers that uh, below each of these presentations, below each, each of, of these shows, lies uh, the PDF presentation and slide presentation uh, of each show which can be accessed and which obviously has a tremendous amount of information. Yes, that's uh, a good point, Fabian. Thank you. It was one of your suggestions that we do that. And uh, we try, unlike other shows, we we're now getting the PDF files up in advance of, of viewing so that you can look at, look at them before we begin. And you can have the luxury of having it printed out if you have a printer. Uh, and you know, looking at it as we go through the material. You could also email it to Huma Abedin and for convenience just have her print it out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or walk it by, what is it, 15 right. old schoolhouse lane in Chappaqua? Something like that. Drop it in the, no, in the it, mailbox. It's there. not classified, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, now we We've run through Janine Pirro uh, already. I'd I like to jump to uh, Fabien, if it's okay. Now, Fabien, I, we, we discussed, you know, a few of these things beforehand, but uh, what I've done here is I've put up Fabien's LinkedIn entry, which is really remarkable. I thought you were just a playboy. Uh, it's a part-time job. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, we'll, we'll pull it up in a second here, and uh, and if you hit the show more, uh, and you go down the page, yeah, you see, uh, first, well, many, many, this Telnik thing is something that I that we were involved. You were leading it, but we were involved together with that. Um, but you've you've helped create companies. You've run various types of uh, investment funds, be it venture capital, uh, funds that parcel capital up to different styles. Um, you were, on, this was a public company, right, Morella Prom? Yes. It so was. you were chairman of the compensation committee of a large public company in France, and... A member of the audit committee too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and co-founded the chart group with me, which is something we did together for a number of years, uh, and indeed, you also have 
uh, you know, you've been on the board of many, many different companies around the world. Plus, you've also written articles that have been published in leading publications around the world in addition. Isn't that correct? That's correct, yes. Actually, and even set up uh, and co-managed uh, a think tank, which was actually the first independent uh, think tank in France in 1996 called Fondation Concorde. It still exists, actually. Good. Has nothing to do with that Concord management that was uh, that Mueller indicted, does it? Uh, I, I hope not. <laughs> nor, nor the supersonic no. jet. <laughs> oh, see, since I left in 2005, uh, and I can explain later uh, why, but that's another subject. Uh, you know, I can't vouch for whatever happens or happened after I left. So, so Fabian has been, and thank you very much, Fabian. I know you're beginning your vacation very soon. And you, it's long overdue, and I hope you really enjoy it. And it's, it's 9.37 up there in, in Paris right now, so I don't want to keep you up too late. But um, you've it's done better a lot than of work with Japan, us on Unitaid, excellent work. Um, and a gating question for me, I was talking to that doctor this morning. You know, the light bulb went off and said, no, wait a minute, Fabian Chalandon, Jason Goodman and Charles Ortel can't decide, hey, why don't we distribute HIV AIDS drugs? I mean, you, you just can't do that. I mean, you've got, you even have- Even for charity? Not even, you know, especially not for charity. Damn. You have to have, you know, these drugs are dangerous and you, you have to distribute drugs. In, I, I don't know what it's like in France, but to distribute dangerous drugs in the United States of America- You have you, to be Herbert Walker Bush. <laughs> no, you have to be licensed. You have to have, sure. you know, there are all kinds of uh, approvals that you have to get federally, state by state. And I don't think they ever did that. You know, they were managing a drug, a gigantic drug procurement and delivery system from an unregistered office in, in, Mass, in Mass, two of them in Massachusetts, uh, raising money around the world, including, I think, stealing it from France in part, and buying these, these dangerous drugs not controlling any of this properly, supposedly in the guise of charity. And here we have this link, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Medicine, if you can hit that one, please. Medicine, Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, you know, I don't know, if, are those, those people are reputable, aren't they, Fabian? Yes, no, no, they are, they are reputable, yes. Yeah, I and, mean. Uh, they're actually doing quite a good job. So these people, we, we need to make contact with these people and ask them, you know, what do they think of what the Clinton Foundation has been doing? They must know. I mean, they're all over the place. Yeah, in, in, unfortunately, I, mean, they, uh, I think one of the weaknesses of the French aid system, international aid system, is that they don't have any implementation organizations. And I know that Médecins Sans Frontières was approached to do that job and they refused. Uh, independently of Unitaid or the Clinton Foundation. Um, why? I don't know. I've never really managed to get to the bottom of that. Um, but, you know, their, their job is mainly to send doctors. And for that job, they've been doing quite a good job, a very good job for the past, what, 20, 25 years? Yeah. I know a neurosurgeon at uh, Columbia who participates in Doctors Without Borders, and he's a very honorable guy. I don't think he'd be involved if it weren't on the up and up. You know, actually, as I think about it, I, I think you also know another doctor pretty well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we should ask that other doctor. I don't know if he's ever... Well, uh, not about this, about, you know, let's say you and I wanted to distribute HIV AIDS drugs. Yeah, no, you yeah, can't well, do But that. what are specific things should we, should we have done? That well, I'll tell you this, the whole distribution of drugs and everything, there was one time an incident where someone in Florida needed a prescription for something, and it was such a big deal to even write a prescription in another state that a doctor, a reputable doctor, wouldn't do it because if the DEA were to investigate that, you'd lose your medical license. You can't just go tossing around pharmaceuticals willy-nilly. Really? It's tightly controlled. Except when it comes to the Clinton Foundation. Except when it comes to the Clinton <laughs> Foundation, right. So if we go back into the slide, um, so Fabien, there's a certain uh, French financial prosecutor, and I've, I don't know if this will work. I got to her page and I translated it to English. Hmm. And I think, 
you know, our viewership is hurt. Oh, it didn't oh. work. Oh, well. Error. Well, it did not work, so it's okay. Uh, we'll just go back. Mm -hmm. And if you go on Wikipedia, there is a page. Yeah, we could try that. We'll go to Wikipedia. You should Oops. type... Uh, uh, Elian Houlette. Parquet National Financier. You should get it. And then you can translate it. How do I... P-A-R-Q-U-E-T. Q-U-E-T, and then National... Uh, with a T, national with a, no, no, national, like, uh, like in, in English. And then fino, financier, financier. C-I-E-R-E. -E. Is that okay. right? E, another yeah. E. Yeah. Well, you should find there it. Right. There you go. From, Is that no, it? it's not that. Oh. Hmm. And put it, make, and then type France. Or just her name. Parquet, uh, oh, sorry, Parquet, it's P-R-Q-E-U-E-T. -E the T. T after, that's, that's it. A national, national, it's a T too, not a C. My spelling is outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, he did go, Julius of France, uh, and then put wiki, make, put, you know, no, no, it should, it should show up, but. Well. Why would you just use her name? What is the name? The e name is uh, Eliane, E-L-I-A-N-E, -E, and then Elouette, which is E-L-O-U-E-T-T-E, -E, I think. No, it's Hulet, I think. It's H-O... I'll try to look at it on my side. H-O-W-L-E-T-T. Uh, H O U. Okay. Elian. H O U. L no W. L E T T E. E. Yep. What? I don't know. Not finding Elian. Let's well, try. Let's go, go back to the body of the slide. I got it, but uh, yeah, I've got it in French. There she is. I've got it. So perhaps you could so tell uh, Fabian, give us a flavor. -E -E and then Oulet, H O U L E. I think we've got her here. So, so if you could, Fabian, your own words, give us a sense. Please give the viewers a sense of just how powerful this person is and what her role is. And is she somebody who might care about the Clinton Foundation and the fact that the government of France sent a lot of money via Unitaid to the Clinton Foundation? Yeah. So, uh, the, I mean, she, she occupies a post which probably has no equivalent in the U.S. Uh, it would be basically a deputy attorney general with jurisdiction over the entire U.S. Uh, on anything that relates to complex fraud or international fraud. Um, this her post was created in 2011 by the French President Mr. Hollande to actually deal specifically with these international frauds or complex frauds. Uh, she has a small team of probably around 20 prosecutors. Uh, they're overextended, from what I can read in the press. Um, and um, she was the lady behind the sort of coup against Mr. Uh, François Fillon, who was the then French candidate against Mr. Macron, coming from the right. Uh, and Charles, to correct what you were saying, in France there was an attempt by the right to seize the power from the leftists and the liberals. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this attempt was embodied by Mr. François Fillon uh, and it failed because Mrs. Elouette launched an investigation into Mr. Fillon's finances, who, by the way, were not very clear, and he made some stupid mistakes, even serious mistakes. Um, and I won't get into the details of it, but it's public. Uh, but she basically moved very quickly after him and um, basically crushed his campaign. And that's probably the main reason was why Mr. Fillon was not elected and why Mr. Macron was elected. 
Now, um, as any French prosecutor, uh, she is not independent from political power. Uh, she actually uh, he's, uh, she actually works on the sort of so-called hierarchical position defined uh, and run by the Minister of Justice, uh, so the equivalent of uh, Mr. Session. Uh, the Minister of Justice cannot really block what she's doing, but there are a number of ways through which the Minister of Justice can influence a prosecutor and even a judge in France uh, when it comes to their promotions, decorations, etc. Um, now, she acted in independently in the case of Mr. Francois Fillon in 2000, uh, during the election of 2016. Uh, whether this was totally independent or uh, some kind of machination or conspiracy organized by the then president, Mr. Hollande, against Mr. Fillon, uh, is a matter of debate and has been a matter of public debate in France. Okay. So there is a suspicion that she was not totally independent. Uh, whether she would go after the Clinton Foundation, uh, she, I've already written to her. Uh, I was already interrogated by the French police a year ago, shortly on this matter, but uh, to the point, and they have received a lot of documentation uh, stemming basically from uh, joint efforts on UNITAID and the Clinton Foundation with Charles. Um, I have not received any news. Uh, there are the same rules in France and in the US in respect of confidentiality and uh, secrecy of proceedings, uh, um, which are applicable uh, to uh, to any proceedings on the grand jury in the U.S. In France, when a prosecutor undertakes proceedings, that secrecy is not legally watertight or legally fully protected. It is fully protected when the next step happens is when the prosecutor requests an investigative judge to do the investigation. To my knowledge, this has not yet happened. Mm -hmm. So I now, don't know why... Issue, the we... issue, Charles, is that the biggest angle on the Clinton Foundation today is the U.S. Right. And a lot of countries, including France, cannot really proceed against it, uh, uh, and especially in the case of France, because it goes through UNITAID, which is a Swiss-based NGO managed by the international organization WHO, which in itself has full Im immunity from any prosecution unless President Trump uh, um, recalls it. Right. Okay, so it's bloody complicated legally. Right. And I'm, I mean legally, I mean penal law, criminal law. Right, right. Well, so if we could go back into the uh, slide there for a second, Jason. Uh, that's a great uh, and helpful summary there, Fabian. Um, what we've done here is to lay out some of the various governments that really need to care about this. So. I know you live normally in Japan, or you live in Japan, uh, yes. and I don't know how normally you live, but you live <laughs> no, I live totally normally in Japan, it's the, for me the last civilized country in the world. But um, there's a gentleman who has some explaining to do. Uh, this guy goes by Tachi, T-A-C-H-I, Yamada, and Tachi Yamada was, you know, he's a distinguished 72 year old guy with multiple, he's probably a 13 Blackberry guy. He's on boards all over the world and all kinds of credentials and Takeda Pharmaceuticals where he had an affiliation, top affiliation, uh, is, is one of the biggest co countries, uh, companies in the world. But this gentleman is, is certainly very, very smart. And he was in charge for a time at the Gates Foundation of leading their whole health division, which is the biggest piece of the Gates, division, uh, Gates Foundation, just at the time that the Clinton Foundation illegally reorganized starting September 29th, 2009. This guy was involved in the old chai, 
at the Gates Foundation, which is a big donor to the Clinton Foundation and Chai, and then to the new Chai. And, you know, he swans around on all these different, I mean, look at all his degrees, MD, PhD, and awards and all this stuff. He swans around the world. He's probably very wealthy at this point. He's a scientist, a doctor and a scientist. He needs, some people need to start asking him and the Japanese government some very tough questions about just exactly why uh, he would let the Gates, encourage the Gates Foundation to contribute money to an organization that didn't lawfully exist, a lot of money, over $150 million directly, put 60, or lots of money, another 100 million or so into this unit aid, uh, be the stamp of approval for all these governments. When the Gates Foundation comes into a big venture, other governments say, well, Bill Gates is putting his money in, it must be pretty serious. This guy, Yamada, needs to be asked some tough questions. Because I, I think, you know, either he is not that smart, which is possible, or, uh, you know, he basically just turned a blind eye and got to a place where he, he couldn't stand up and say, no, it is absolutely wrong to distribute toxic, adulterated, untested drugs around the world in the name of charity, taking money from all these different governments. You know, you, you, you shouldn't be able to go to the blue chip club and pretend that you're a good guy when you didn't stand up and put your foot down and say to Mr. Gates, look, I know it's your money, but I'm a doctor and I'm not going to let you know, my professional reputation go out the window because your money is going to produce, is going to purchase adulterated drugs that's going to, that are going to kill children around the world and these politicians are going to pretend that it's all great. I'm not going to do that. Charles, has there been any study or any kind of uh, feedback in terms of what the impact of these drugs that were distributed by the Clinton Foundation has been? Well, well, there have been multiple claims by the Clintons that it went fantastic. I mean, Hillary campaigned on it, Bill, came, you know, during her campaign. But no studies as far as the efficacy or any injuries? It's, or it, it's very if tough I, to... If I may interject on this point, uh, I think the two Pinko Panthers presentation we did, Charles, uh, we ran through the report from French Cour des Comptes, right. which basically stated that... Uh, there was no way of measuring the real impact of this uh, program uh, run by UNITAID through the Clinton Foundation on the local health uh, system and that actually nobody knew uh, even if the proper medication and with the proper time limits were actually distributed locally. Exactly right. You know, Fabian, so I nobody, don't know... Nobody I don't know if we've had the chance to share this with you, but that Pinko Panthers episode that we did was the subject of essentially a cyber attack. It quite clearly contained explosive information because if you look at this, I don't know if you can see that on the screen share right there. I, but I, I saw it, yes, I remember. Yeah, mm. Right, they, they gave it 1,400 thumbs down, which would seem to serve to limit the viewership. It only has 14,000 views and uh, 1,100 thumbs down. There's been a public admission by someone who worked for a company called Shadowbox, which is essentially a private cyber, I guess, security firm, but it really seems to be a reputation destruction and opposition research kind of firm specializing in these types of social media attacks to quash information that's not in line with what that group wants to put forward. So that's obviously a very important presentation and it's worth people going back and looking at it again, perhaps. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Now, now there, there's also another Japanese angle, Charles, in this presentation, which uh, uh, there's a gentleman which name I forgot, but you can easily, they can, you can easily be found back uh, in the, 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 sec well, the second presentation of the Pinko Panthers, the one running for the Clinton Foundation from 2010 to 2016. Uh, in 2016, there's a Japanese gentleman who resigned from his, from, who retired from his post at WHO. And it happens that uh, this gentleman was actually, had been actually overseeing UNITAID since inception at WHO. And this gentleman, uh, Japanese gentleman, is, has a pedigree similar to the one you just uh, presented, Charles, 
and he's currently an advisor to the, to the Japanese government and a senior fellow of the top medical university in Tokyo today. I've identified where he is, I even have his email, and uh, this is a gentleman who actually should know quite a lot of what really happened at UNITAID, uh, especially during the years you mentioned, which are critical, which is 2006 to 2009. And uh, by the way, for the viewers, uh, we've already evidenced uh, through reconciliation that uh, difference between the sums UNITAID has declared to have sent to the Clinton Foundation and the sums that the Clinton Foundation has declared to have received from governments, there's a shortfall of $77 million missing for these three years already, and it could be over $200 million if we had a non-unitated government grants, which have not been declared at all prior to 2007. That's good so money. There is a, already a very large pot of money which cannot be reconciled uh, with public filings, uh, and so, you know, there are two possibilities, either, uh, I mean, there are three possibilities. Either Charles and I are wrong, and that's impossible. Okay? No, that's not I'm possible. I'm sorry to say that, that's not possible. <laughs> Especially the two of us at the same time, and in parallel. So, uh, the two other possibilities are that, you know, either the, uh, the United board document on which, which we've used to produce the reconciliation was a lie, or a mistake, or uh, the Clinton Foundation uh, filed fraudulent documents to the American IRS. I think you're onto something be a there, of both. Fabio. <laughs> Sorry? I Sorry? think the last option, you may be onto something there. Uh, I, I think so. I think so. I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm using British understatement. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was educated. Right. So Sorry, Charles, please. If we go back to the slide, Jason, if it's okay, yeah. So um, one thing I found, I didn't pick up on this, Fabian, as I should have, but if we hit this Unitaid link here, uh, the head of Unitaid is from Brazil, the new head. Yes, absolutely. Now, Brazil is a country that Fabian spent time in. You have many friends in Brazil. I have friends in Brazil. My Love grandmother Brazil. was Brazilian. Um, and. You know, Brazil is in a state of disrepair that is unusual uh, at this point from coming off as being, it looks like Lady Di a little bit actually, from coming off um, uh, at one point being the darling of the BRIC, British, Russia, India, China, or I'm sorry, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Brazil today is in turmoil. Uh, here we have the former foreign minister of Brazil is now the chairman of Unitaid. I think we need to put some major league pressure on the government of Brazil and on this guy to explain what actually happened in the beginning. Why did Brazil sign up with great fanfare in 2006 to be a founding member of Unitaid, but then refused advance money, which they did for a number of years? And why did they force the Unitaid board to fly all the way down to Brasilia, the only foreign meeting I believe they've ever had in 2007 or 8? You know, what was going on there? I think what was going on is that the Brazilians who, the, the medical team that they had, the executive director of Unitaid was Brazilian. I think they knew very well what was the right way to do this HIV AIDS stuff. And they knew very well that the Clinton Foundation was not doing it properly. And there was a tug of war, I suspect, back in that time frame, where, you know, a decision was made, all right, now we'll have this investigation and we'll let people off. but. People in Brazil had to have known back then there was a problem, and now they must know by now that there certainly is a problem, and we need to put some pressure on this dude. Well, yeah, the, the, the problem is that he was only elected uh, chairman of Unitaid uh, in 2016. Uh, before that, it was Mr. Douce de Blasi, the French uh, f former foreign minister who founded Unitaid. And uh, Mr. Celso Amorim uh, was before joining United, uh, Brazil Brazilian foreign minister. So as a foreign minister, he should have some knowledge of what was going on. Uh, but he, he was not involved as such in the operations of United at all. So right. um, I understand that he's 
know, a decent guy and quite competent. Uh, he's actually the first paid chairman of Unitaid. Uh, what surprised me is that, uh, I don't know if you looked recently at the Unitaid website, from which we extracted actually all the documents, the public documents, uh, which formed the basis of our reconciliation. Uh, but, you know, there has not been one single document published on the website since he joined in 2016. Really? Yeah, nothing. So no board minutes, no resolutions, nothing. Huh. Maybe they are studying this. Uh, it could be because you know, remember, uh, you know, he 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 was nominated in two thousand in early two thousand sixteen. I think in March. Uh, you started your investigation in two thousand six early two thousand and fifteen. March two thousand fifteen. Yeah. In March two thousand fifteen. The UTA staff started to come out through your woodwork, uh, uh, probably at the end of 2015 already, uh, and it could be that UNITAID was informed about that. And remember, uh, and I think in one, my second presentation, I, I said uh, that you know the conditions in which Mr. Dusteblazi was actually asked to leave were not normal, he didn't even have proper thanks, and he was the founding guy. Huh. Uh, uh, whereas every single member that left, including the Japanese gentleman at WHO, had profuse thanks. Okay. Uh, four or five lines of profuse thanks in the board minutes. Hmm. There's not one single profuse thanks for Mr. Dustoblasi in the board minutes. So, hmm. you know, that's a bad sign. So something happened uh, which... Uh, triggered certainly also the change of the executive secretary, who's kind of CEO of Unitaid in 2014, and he's triggered himself a drastic restructuring of Unitaid that went on for two years. Uh, and that was almost finished when Mr. Sergio Amorim, the Brazilian gentleman, took over from Mr. Gusto Brazil. So, um, the, you know, the guys who knows everything, especially in the 2006 to 2010 time frame uh, are the Japanese gentleman and Mr. Dustubezi. Yep. Well, we need to push hard on that. And then uh, we go back in. Um, this is a very interesting story. I don't know if you've seen it. Both of you have seen this, this link. Uh, Her Majesty's government has got to step in. I, didn't, I, I looked up this Hacklet thing, uh, and here's an old story. MI6, a death in China, and the very secret of Mayfair com Company full of spooks. Now, it's in the Evening Standard in the UK, which is, you know, that's, that's an okay uh, newspaper, but it's not the, the Times. It's, uh, it's not the Telegraph. Uh, but nonetheless, six years ago, there were stories asking questions about this hacklet, uh, which is, you know, it and, and firms like it that operate in the UK setting globally uh, you know, they, they're resting places for, for former, and some would argue, continuing spies who go into the private sector employment. They're able to charge corporations and other people large sums of money to give their advice and do deals and whatever. This practice has got to be reined in. You know, we, around the world, we can't have, you know, a security service, 17 security agencies in the United States, and all these private contractors, and all these obscure people doing the kind of work that Christopher Steele did, you know, look at the damage that Christopher Steele and the use of Christopher Steele has caused in relations between the number one and number two uh, governments in terms of governments that own nuclear weapons. You know, how can we argue that it's sensible, you know, to encourage this type of behavior, to have this idiot Christopher Steele first work for the establishment wing of the Republican Party, then work for the crooked wing of the Democratic Party, and I'm assuming that there is a sliver that's not crooked, otherwise I'd call it the crooked corpus of the Democratic Party, but um, this idiot then walks in and is working with the Clinton campaign and in, it seems, connivance with the Obama administration to break almost every conceivable election law out there uh, in, the, in the hopes of either stopping Donald Trump from being president or it, once he became president, you know, overturning the will of the people. 
and triggering his impeachment. Surely, you know, we look at, the, at what happens here. You know, these, these spies, they do great work. They're not paid the way, way CEOs are paid or investors are paid or whatever, but they get nice retirement packages. You know, they should stick to that and not start, you know, leave that type of work only to come in, you know, to, to start in the private sector, walking out the, ba the front or the back door of their previous employer, let's say with, with uh, sensitive information that can be used in commerce. This, this, this porous relationship between the security services and private contractors and investors and politicians, this needs to be regulated. Our constitution didn't contemplate this. Uh, most con uh, government constitutions didn't contemplate this. And we have got to change this. And Her Majesty's government needs to step up. I think the root cause uh, of it, the, uh, the real instigator of mayhem in relations around the world against Donald Trump is actually the UK and elements within the UK. I think that's what we're going to discover here, that it's not yeah. as simple as you know, holding Russia out as a bogeyman. It could well be. It's you know, Tony Blair loyalists who love the Clintons and love Barack Obama refuse to countenance both a Brexit in the UK and a Donald Trump in the White House, and they have been doing their level best to oppose uh, Donald Trump before the election, during the election, and now after the election leading into the midterm elections. This is going to be, I think Donald Trump, frankly, is being too nice to Theresa May. I think he should turn the pressure up on her and these Brits to say, listen, you, you don't get to do things the way you're doing it, right? We, you're a very important uh, partner. We'll forgive that little bother in 1812 to 1814 when you burned down the White House. We've fixed it since then. You know, we'll let you go on that one. You helped us out in World War I and World War II. You've helped us out in Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that. But nonetheless, you know, what you, your people did, you know, with these crooked members of the Obama administration and maybe even the Bush administration, you can't do this. You know, you cannot, you may not do this, and we will punish. If I were, you would want me to be president of the United States because I, I would kick some serious ass here. <laughs> you know, Charles, just last week, Bill Binney said that he felt these private contractors in the uh, intelligence world and the security business were like the biggest problem there is at the NSA. Well, if you think about it, right, you're sitting in your government pol working in the NSA, let's say you make 125000 or 150, whatever the number is, but you have information on your computer that's worth a billion dollars or $10 billion, right. right? How tough is it for you to, you know, your wife comes to you one day and says, you know, honey, I'm kind of tired of, you know, chicken a la king tuna or whatever, you know, tuna a la, whatever they call it. I don't know. Charlie Boy uh, tuna, you know, uh, <laughs> canned chicken tuna. Chicken of the sea. Chicken yeah. of the sea, yeah. Chick is it chicken or is it fish? Right, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of that. You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to have a nice big mansion, you know, go on trips well, to Paris. And so you end up with, with a whole bunch of these people who get, go out of doing great work as a public servant, the Clintons included, who have this taste of the ch champagne and caviar lifestyle, well, and then they basically monetize their time in public service. And these firms, if they exist, should be every bit as what regulated, more regulated yes. than investment banks, commercial banks, the extent law firms are regulated, accounting for, I mean, you can't, you just can't have, I don't think, these private army firms around the world that are completely unregulated. It's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, and the deterrent <laughs> should be the likely possibility of being stuck in jail, which so far, that right. hasn't happened. Right. Can I have, can I interject a few little Please. comments? Sure. Uh, first one is that from my own knowledge of these things, uh, government tend to use private companies for the stuff they can't do themselves directly. Yeah? That's the basic principle of the secret services everywhere in the world, in open societies. Um, so that does raise a big question. Oh. Uh, the second element is that um, Mr. Bantley, uh, was it the Daily Telegraph or one of the UK newspapers, and I sent you the link a while ago, Charles, published a few months ago the fact that Mr. Skripal, the British-Russian MI6 agent uh, who was jailed by the Russians because he was a double agent and then expelled again as part of the so-called Chapman Exchange in 2010, is a friend of Mr. Steele. 
And the article was saying that he may have, or actually he has participated into the drafting of the steel dossier. Hmm. And it's the same Mr. Skripal who was poisoned. And hmm. who was then, whose poisoning was then used to uh, put the blame on the Russians. Wow, that's the first I've heard that. Yeah. That's pretty well, explosive. And uh, it's public knowledge. Now, the interesting thing is that, from what I read on the internet, the day after this article was published, and it's available on the internet, the UK government slapped a so-called D-notice on the newspaper, and the D-notice system in the UK is a mechanism by which, uh, when there's sensitive information in relation to national security, which is going to be published or has been published but could be republished and uh, or extended, extensively published, then uh, the editor-in-chief has the obligation to, uh, the moral obligation, because of course everything is not uh, bounded by law, but has the obligation to submit all the papers to a special commission, which members are listed is actually secret, and which decides whether or not it's going to be published in full or in, or in part. Yeah? Hmm. So, following that article, the UK government slapped a denotice on, I think it was the, uh, the Telegraph. Third comment, uh, you know, the chairman of Heyklut, this UK intelligence firm, has gen just been nominated a few months ago, the chairman of the Economist as well. So how, how uh, is Lord Dayton, his name? He's a businessman uh, with pluses and minuses from what I can read on the internet. I don't know him personally, even if I spent 10 years working out of London uh, in the city. Um, uh, I just wonder how you can be chairman of a secretive outfit, which main job is to hide secrets and at the same time the chairman of a newspaper, which job is to actually disclose everything. Well, isn't the job of the economist to sell unregulated globalism? That's uh, <laughs> certainly uh, some of, the, of their uh, actually journalists' main job, yeah. especially Was Washington DC correspondent uh, and uh, Lex Lexington, the guy who's hiding behind the term Lexington. Right. And I read The Economist every week, uh, and I've been reading it for the past 40 years, so I've seen their growing bias, uh, which, is, which has reached alarming level, to the point where I even saw a letter from an American professor of a business school down in the South, uh, which was complaining about it, I actually wrote to this professor who kindly responded to me and we exchanged our views on this terrible trend because that is going to destroy the economists. Uh, so I did write to the chief editor of the economist, uh, uh, Mrs. Minton Beddows, uh, to raise the alarm uh, and uh, to tell her that basically, you know, if she doesn't stop that bias, uh, this will destroy the very newspaper which has been probably the top weekly newspaper in the world for the past 150 years. Yeah. Well, amazing. So if we jump back in, uh, this is an important thing, uh, this, this link here, that explains this idea of revocation. We, we've talked about this, but when, I was, when we were on with Judge Jeanine uh, earlier and I said, you know, why doesn't Donald Trump you know, do something at this point? I mean, this, is, this, this tool available in the United States is a powerful tool. The IRS at any time can, you know, decide, having studied a matter, having opened an investigation, which happened, hello, two years ago, um, that an organization has strayed from its authorized purpose. And if it has done that without ta <coughs> talking to the IRS, if it changes its purpose, with, the, the IRS has the right to retroactively revoke the charter, the federal tax exempt status of a charity going back to the moment in time where they veered off their authority. And I would argue that, that they veered off their authority by January 29th, 1998. That's the day when they received their uh, determination letter from the IRS. This thing has never been operated lawfully. 
and the record is crystal clear as the world will soon see because we've been working, Fabian and I and others, on an exhaustive um, set of documents which we will be sharing before the election so that people and government authorities will have no excuse for failure to act. There's a powerful tool that the IRS has to revoke the authority. There's no statute of limitation issue. That is to say, you know, the IRS has a right to go way back, and especially because the Clinton Foundation never filed a tax return for its first partial year. So there's no, no bar to going right the way back to 1997, 98 and saying, everything you've done since then is not a charity. You're a taxable for profit corporation at best. At worst, you're a collection of individuals who don't have the protection of corporate, the corporate veil for, for liability and indemnity. Uh, and it's a gigantic criminal enterprise. And you just send these people a huge tax bill, and the, which the IRS would concoct. And then it is, the, our, our system may be a little different than France's. Then it is the obligation when this happens of the defendants, be it the, the nonprofit the corporation, or the, no, the defendants, the, the uh, Clinton, Clinton Foundation, Foundation and, and the um, individuals involved, to prove to the IRS that the IRS is wrong. It's a very, you, our tax system is, is really rugged, so in, in charity land. So why isn't the IRS moving here? And that's, I think, one of the reasons why the French government can be forgiven, the UK government, the Brazilian, the Japanese, and other foreign governments can be forgiven, is that we haven't done what is obvious at this point. It is obvious this is a fraud. And, you know, it is past time, I implore you, President Trump, and your administration, it is past time for you to step up to the plate and get this done before the Clintons raise more money to enrich themselves and to fund this illegal attempt to uh, use charity money to fund political candidates in the forthcoming election. Time is of the essence. And Charles, if I may add, uh, I think the second effect on the tax standpoint is that the donors have the 50% tax exemption, uh, which is applicable for public charities, uh, revoked by the IRS as well. So they have to refund the IRS for 50% of all their donations. I'm talking obviously of American taxpayers. Well, it's actually even, depending on your perspective, I think you and I and Jason would say it's even better than that, and the Clintons will probably say it's even worse than that. Actually, the way it works is that if you, if you think about two categories of people, the individuals, innocent individuals, which there are some, who may have sent money in here, and, and they, they, you're right, they get a tax, they can deduct up to 50% of their pre-tax income they can deduct in charitable donations because this in theory is a public charity, not a private foundation. If it were a private foundation, their donations would only be 30% of in maximum donations. But the real hammer comes on the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller, other foundations. There the penalty is not simply that you give your tax benefits back. The IRS has the right under existing law to go to a big donor like the Gates Foundation and say, hey, Bill, Supposedly, you're smart. And, you know, you've made, your, ch your charity's given like 150 donations to this fraud. We would have excused one, maybe two, not 150. So not only are we going to punish you by saying that you've got to pay a special excise tax on the a large excise tax, which could be greater than the value of the donation, we're going to shut your charity down. We're going to say that you have been, you've been putting your money into this thing because you've been funding a political campaign. You thought that by giving these 150 million, it was a cheap way to get a big lever to stop an antitrust investigation of Microsoft or to stop other things that you might be concerned about. That's why you did this. The Gates Foundation is not a bona fide private foundation. It's a, it is like the Clinton Foundation, we would argue, the IRS might argue, it is. A personal enormous foundation. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, Gates is a monopolist. His people are monopolists. You know, thank you for giving some of our, the money that you shouldn't have had for being a monopolist back, you know, keeping, uh, reaping all these profits that you've obviously reaped when you look at the financial statements of Microsoft. And the real penalty would be the IRS could look at Bill Gates and say, hey, thank you for putting $40 billion in your foundation. We'll take that. We'll take all of it. Because this is nothing more than a criminal organization. You should have seen this, you're smart enough, you know, 
you put enormous pressure and maybe you get everybody, all the angels around the world saying, oh, you can't do this to Bill Gates, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, the, the, the counter argument is, well, wait a minute. Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are arguing about the world becoming more unequal. All we are doing is reducing inequality by taking this wealth and what we're going to do is pay down our debt with this money that you should have paid to the tax authorities a long time ago. So it's actually even more serious for, <laughs> than simply just getting the tax benefits back. So if we go back into the slide, Jason. There you have Bill and yeah, sorry. Um, you, we don't have to hit this link, but Fabia raised the excellent point that uh, the way American law works is that yes, the World Health Organization is, is technically, you know, operates under immunity, technically. But under our law in America, the President of the United States does have the right, if there's massive fraud as there would appear to be here, to say, uh-uh, as far as the United States is concerned, we will not respect Unitaid sovereign immunity or the Clinton Foundation's claim to sovereign immunity because one important reason is it doesn't exist. And you can't, you can't get, I mean, it doesn't exist lawfully in the United States. You can't get immunity for something that doesn't exist. What is sovereign immunity? So the principle of sovereign immunity is that if you're acting in the service of a nation that, uh, well, France, let's say, you know, I can't go after a government official, uh, a French government official on, to, for breaking an American law readily. There are exceptions, but readily. In this, in this case, what the Clintons are trying to hide behind is that Unitaid and WHO are multilateral things like the, like the uh, World Bank, and they're trying to argue that, they may try to argue, look, we're above all that, these pesky national laws, they don't apply to us. Well, yes, actually, the, the, uh, you know, the, there's a UN convention to which all the governments have signed on, uh, which defines for its personal and for its actions right. totally unity from any proceedings, whether criminal or not. Uh, now, uh, the issue is that under US law, I think, uh, this immunity is not valid uh, and actually, under even the convention, the international convention itself, this immunity is not valid if the activity has nothing to do with the normal international activities which have been defined in the original statute of the international organization. So, uh, whilst the Clinton Foundation can claim or try to claim that their actions which is a prolongation of Unitaid itself, an administrative body of WHO, uh, is protected under this specific international statute. The reality is that, you know, because their activities have nothing to do with the original uh, intent of uh, these international organizations, and de facto is a criminal organization, then that immunity basically um, is revoked. Yeah. But I think it needs a specific order of the U.S. president to do so. Yes. Well, let's, we, we'll hope that Janine will get that on President Trump's agenda. But, It'd uh, be great. It'd yeah. be great. Now, Fabia, you've done a lot of work on, away from the Clinton Foundation on uranium and the uranium market. Yes. And um, I don't think, uh, I'm sensitive to the time. It's already now 1025 where you are. Um, That's all right. I mean, it's, I'm fine, guys. It's much better than Japan, I promise you. Okay. Take, take the time you need. Um, but, you know, here we see that this is an article, I think, in, I'm not sure what White House News is, but that it, it's quite possible that Mueller is conflicted here in that he may have not taken the investigation into Uranium One as far down the line as it should have gone. And so he's not in a position, truly, to, to find the truth as, as pertains to the Clinton Foundation, or he's, he may be using, he's not independent, let's say, as a special counsel. He has skeletons in his closet, I think, during, uh, arising during his long tenure as FBI director from September 4th, 2001, September 4th, 2013, precisely when the Clinton Foundation scandal, you know, went from being a small mess to being the largest unprosecuted set of frauds in the world. So, 
Yeah, yeah I love the picture of Hillary there. That's that's her she basic answer. What me worrying? Yeah, she doesn't look too worried, Charles. <laughs> she's just she, sort of. She's swallowed those. an umbrella. You say. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he say? Swallowed an umbrella. <laughs> Your English is pretty good. So, and then if we nope. go into the slides, I just, um, I just have a, one comment of uranium one, which I uh, sure I, 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 I addressed. It. At one stage, is that you know when the uranium one deal was originally signed? I think uh, the first part was in 2009 when the third of the Fabian, I think we lost him. Was that? No. Uh, the Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, no, you cut good. out you there froze for, for a, a moment. Fabian. We're having some difficulty with the Skype connection. That's not actually unusual this past week. Fabian? We'll call yep. you back, Fabian. Yes. Okay, there you That's, go. Uh, I'm back. Can You're you back. Okay, good, good, good. Sorry. Okay, so uh, I, I think Charles, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the Iranian one deal started in 2009 by which Ro Rosatom, the Russian state owned company, uh, spe specialized in uranium and nuclear, uh, bought a third of Mr. Joustra's operation, and then progressively, over the preceding three years, bought the rest. Now, in 2009, 2010, I know as a fact that the entire uranium industry had only one obsession, which was to buy uranium all around the world because they thought that the uranium reserves were not going to last more than 30 to 40 years, which was not enough, obviously, uh, to, to sustain the demand of the existing uranium using nuclear plants. So how on earth, in 2009, could America decide to sell 20% of its own uranium reserves at a time where everybody was actually uh, very anxious to protect their supplies of uranium. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I totally agree. And I think, I actually think it, it goes into um, you know, a long standing um, effort on beha behalf of our government, the United States government, and other governments that are, you know, have big manufacturing and, and energy needs. Uh, to think through sources of supply. I mean, you, in, in the, as you and I both know from having done work together in energy, you know, you, you don't just wake up one morning and say, you know, I think I'll go buy some oil. I mean, you, you, if you're going to be a serious player in a business, you want to make sure you have long-term secure sources of supply of energy. And that means today thinking through the various components of energy from, as, as Donald Trump likes to talk about because we have so much of it, clean coal to natural gas and petroleum, and in particular, uranium. Is it clean? I mean, isn't coal toxic to the environment, creating uh, mercury in the atmosphere and the water? Uh, I, I don't, I can't argue the science with you. All I can say is that coal burns in a way that is different than petroleum and, uh, and natural gas. So when you really think through all of the pluses and minuses of, you know, what is the net impact, the net harm or net, net benefit to the art. Certain types of coal are actually not bad at all, hmm. for, particularly those that are based inside America. And they have some way of reclaiming the carbon and... The, it, again, I can't argue the science or debate the science, but that's just anyway, we're no, but a that, little bit off there's topic. Coal, there's clean coal, there's also sulfuric coal, coal, which is very bad, and you need specialized, very expensive uh, extracting plants to get the sulfur out. Right. Uh, so that's that's a key problem for sure. Yeah. But there are some coal burning plants today which are efficient and quite clean. The problem is that it emits more coal, more carbon into the atmosphere than gas. Hmm. Hmm. So if we when go burn. When burn. Thank you, Fabian. If we go back to the slides, um, we talked about script ball already, um, but Fabian, uh, if we hit this zero hedge link. Fabien is a man, he, he, he's a, a French person with unusual contacts around the world. So you have deep experience and contacts in Iran. 
And uh, there's something special going on in Iran right now. I think there's, a, is there, I don't know when the, ne the next election is in Iran, but uh, because the United States has reversed course from the disastrous course the Obama administration was on and done so abruptly, Iran is under enormous pressure uh, economically, now strategically. And this morning, actually, I didn't put in the presentation, uh, one of their top people, I think it's Rouhani, has uh, threatened to unleash the mother of all wars, uh, you know, which it, it, it's almost like that you probably didn't have this in France, but there was a funny cartoon when I was a little kid called Crazy Cat. And, you know, Crazy Cat was a stick figure who was always... I think that's your favorite cartoon. Oh, you know, I love Crazy Cat. It's the first <laughs> cartoon I ever saw. And, uh, yeah, so they're, they're, you know, they're out there threatening us. Meanwhile, the Iranians are also saying that you know, Europe better play ball because if they don't play ball and oppose the U.S., uh, then the Iranians are going to release information about who in Europe and elsewhere has been taking bribes to get this uh, various deals along. Yeah, there you have Crazy Cat. Like here, Crazy Cat. Zip. <laughs> that mouse. Anyway. Huh. In case you hadn't seen it, Fabian. Crazy cat. Now, Fabian, we've lost your video. Do you want to try possibly toggling your camera to see if you can restore video? There we go. Excellent. You're back. Are we back? You're back. Yes. Yeah, you were, you were, you were very stone-faced there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do now, uh, gentlemen, is go into some related things. And Fabian, at any time, if you need to bug out or whatever, just let us know and, and we can let you off the hook because we have four or five more slides to go through. Okay, no, it, I'm, I'm fine. If, if you need me, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, if you don't need me, I'm fine. So just tell me. No, no we love having you, but uh, uh, you know, it's your vacation. Just we'll, we'll continue on here. So you, uh, you suggested by email, Fabian, that uh, we really needed to focus a little bit on this Carter Page uh, uh, development mm -hmm. overnight, or really Friday, that uh, it seems what we're hearing is basically the decision to uh, go after an American citizen, to, to spy on an American citizen on American soil, was taken originally on the basis of, I'm just going to use a, an old English word, on a bullshit decision by, uh, you know, whoever was going before the judge to not explain the true origins of this Steele dossier, not explain that the FBI felt Steele was not reliable, and secure a warrant once to, in the middle, in the heat of a campaign, to go after an operative on the Trump campaign in a way that then gave the FBI and others the ability to spy more broadly on the Trump campaign. And, as if, and if that isn't bad enough, in addition to doing all that, and that did happen, it seems, they then swore that warrant out again three more times, including more, most recently, each time under Rod Rosenstein's signature. What do you mean swore it out? So the warrant is good for a certain amount of time and it expires, and then you go back to the judge and you say, Renew it. I, I renew it. And each time you do that, you have to testify to the judge, say this is, you know, I still need this warrant because the arguments I made to you before have only been, are the same or, you know, even stronger for Strong, this. Right. It's been a long standing, as I said, dare I say, trumped up, fraudulent uh, exercise. And we, Fabia, had the pleasure of meeting Carter Page a number of weeks ago. We haven't spoken about that. Too we're much. not supposed to speak too oh, much. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Look, we just we just say that's we, my coded way. Of yeah, I know. I got it. But uh, so we did meet him personally, and you know he's a nice enough person. Uh, but this he's a very affable guy. He right. seems a nice guy. But he, you know, it would seem to me not only is this an outrage, you know, that it happened four times, the first time in <laughs> the three renewals. Not only is that an outrage. What's really an outrage is that that this whole episode is what ultimately triggered the Mueller investigation and it would seem to me that the, everything to do with the Mueller investigation it's is fake. poisoned. It's poisoned by this false warrant. And you know, maybe you know, whatever it's cost is 20 million bucks is not that much money, but the uncertainty in relations between the United States and Russia, 
the uncertainty in relations between the United States and many allies around the world created by this, this absurd mockery of, of an investigation against a private citizen. Now, I would have no problem, you know, if this, this, this behavior had occurred internationally, you know, and was not connected to a political campaign, it was conducted by an objective group of nonpartisan investigators and FBI agents, I'd have no problem with it. But I got a major problem with U.S. government spying on U.S. citizens in the middle of a political campaign where the team in the Department of Justice, the team in the, IR, in the uh, FBI is heavily biased against, you know, Trump and is going after and taking away liberties, having to do, this, this guy's personal life has been the subject now of who knows how many people have his emails and his phone conversations, his mail, whatever, and have gone through his background. How many thugs have been doing this? And it can't just be, well, whoopsie, you know, uh, sorry, Carter. Well, so the financial burden on him, he's yeah. had to defend himself legally. I mean, he, so he didn't do anything really, and they've just been investigating him. It's kind of amazing how many people that's happened to Paul Manafort, Michael Cohen, I'm sure, I mean, Nicole we're going to get to that, but. <laughs> Michael yeah. Friedman. Yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely right. absurd. Yeah, I mean, you, you would think that, you know, we went to sleep in 1989 and Americans now woke up in 2018. We're living in Russia. Right, they flipped, <laughs> right. well, <laughs> not, not just Russia, but Soviet, communist, yeah. USSR. Right. Russia apparently is pretty nice now. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> anyway, if we go to the slide. So, um, but I, I think Charles, just on, on this issue, if I may interject, uh, we had the same we had the same issue in France for the uh, our elections with Mr. Macron against Mr. Fillon and so forth. There was a pro-Russian camp and an anti-Russian camp, to say it bluntly. Okay, the same issue in the U.S. There is a pro-Russian camp. Mr. Trump thinks that the world would be better off if the Americans talk to the Russians and do things together. And there is an anti-Russian camp, uh, which uh, is represented by the deep state, the Obamas, the Clintons, and a few other bad guys like that, uh, who are staunchly opposed to that approach. Uh, and I've been destroying every single attempt to do it, one way or the other, uh, and even to fake blames on Russia if necessary. And I wait my words. Fabian, have you ever seen anything like it in any other country in the history of your career? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, these kind of manipulations, they usually, they were traditionally blamed on the KGB. Uh, uh, but, you know, having said that, the CIA was a mastermind of doing these kind of things internationally. I mean, how many coup attempts and meddling with foreign elections the U.S. has made over the past 50 years, probably once, one a year minimum. Or just so killing the leader, if that's meddling. Yeah. And, the and if necessarily killing the leader. So, yeah. you know, uh, there, there, there is no, no more really, really more into that as far as uh, national interests and foreigners. Hmm. Uh, but as far as national, that's another issue. I mean, yeah. You're perfectly right, Charles, to say that it's unacceptable it's, what has been so done. Right. And, you know, and I, for me, as a foreigner looking at the situation, you know, it looks, you know, there are just too many clues, let's put it that way kindly, of a conspiracy organized by the CIA and the FBI to defend Mr. Trump at all costs, at every single step of uh, his political career when he decided to uh, apply for the job. Okay. And that presumption and that suspicion is hanging in Europe for sure and there are a lot more and more people who think that is the case in Europe even if a lot of Europeans and especially European me medias are quite quiet about it. Right. Uh, but you know I'm hearing a lot of stuff about it uh, and uh, uh, at one stage you know it's the credibility of the Obamas, the Clintons, even the FBI and the CIA which is at stake uh, and uh, in other terms, you know, it's it's a war uh, in which uh, our ancestors were well known for that phrase, you know, 
uh, in which you should never take prisoners. Yeah. How far do you think they're willing to go, in your view, Fabian, to oh. stop Donald Trump? I mean, the maximum. Yeah. Well, I want to give mean, a shout out I'm here to shoes, Ka the Katerina the Blinova at Sputnik, who, uh, th this is right on point, this article, she had the same shameless promo promotion because she was, uh, sent me a whole bunch of questions just on this topic. And um, we'll get this up in a sec. When I said the maximum, so I said extreme, of course. Sorry. Yeah, and what do you see? Because someone just asked this question in a way that caused me to time out the questioner. But what do you think would happen to the country and that we just get Mike Pence in that case? And he's a deep state guy. Well, no, I, I, I think, you know, so far we see in Donald Trump somebody who's pretty clever and who's been under withering criticism before and survived. Uh, he survived near bankruptcy, actually, spectacularly, more than once. I believe it was Dr. Corsi who said that Donald Trump always looks like he's about to lose right before he wins. Yeah, yeah. And so, but it, it's very clear to me that, that he did come under this assault. This is a continuing assault. And a shout out to Katerina, who does great work. She informed me, actually, I'm surprised that in a, two years, we've done 67 interviews, one way or another, either directly or indirectly. But she typically sends me questions. I try to answer them, and then she adds in a whole bunch of other color. And she does all the hard work. And uh, this Sputnik organization actually, while it is government owned, Russian government owned, um, they give their journalists a fair amount of independence. I've, you know, I've never encountered, you know, they never try to put words in my mouth. They, I've said some very critical things. They get published. Um, Lee Stranahan says the same thing. Yeah, very professional. Surprise. I mean, it's not like, say, it's no longer can you say, you know, it's far more professional than CNN, because that's a non-argument. CNN is a joke. It's a comic book. A high school newspaper is far more professional than most CNN. Most of them, yeah. yeah. Most of them. It's funny because they're starting also to have the same reputation in France. RT is doing actually quite a great job. Yeah. Uh, well, our, and our I think RT, Sputnik is starting to. Yeah, Sputnik and RT, I think, are separate, right? Yeah. Oh, they're not. Yes, they are. They are separate. No, no, they're technically they're, they're divisions of the same company. They're, they're RT is, believe it or not, it's interesting. RT, when you talk to, I've, I've had the pleasure now of being on many, many different Russian, I mean, many different channels, but in Russia, many different channels, and RT is actually small, in 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 in, uh, in Russia. It's not really that big. The uh, the big channels. Um, I can't remember all the different names, but they're, they're the equivalent of CBS and ABC and NBC are much, much bigger. Sputnik is, is kind of, is the international, um, I don't know, it's not really the Associated Press, but it's, it operates all over the world and it is government funded. Um, and they have, you know, Lee Stranahan is somebody you've had on the program with us. He's great. Uh, Ekaterina Blanova is uh, a great individual. She's independent. Um, and they do thoughtful, in-depth work. Well, and Charles, you know, we're absolutely smashing it out of the park on the VK.com social <laughs> media <One> network. <laughs> We've got this probably Mr. Putin watching right now <laughs> on VK.com. But uh, there are, you know, we, we used to get several hundred views per video, so I'm not sure what happened we could maybe ask Hillary Clinton. <laughs> don't, please don't write another book like Only that. Only five. I mean, I would expect this video to get over 100 views, but. Well, it's the summer. Maybe they're on vacation. Perhaps. Whoops, I had the wrong. So if we go back into the yes. slide. Let me just. Uh... All right. Um, so we're going to, in the, in the interest of getting through this, because there's a lot here, mm -hmm. people, viewers can, at their convenience, hit these links at home and see these various articles. But uh, this dirty tick trick sentence here, uh, what has happened, and look at this story, 13,000 shares for a story that uh, is now two days old. Uh, you don't have these continuous night after night of protests outside the White House without coordinating it. So it's very clear to me that, you know, going forward for, for the election, the anti-Trump team 
has decided long ago they can see that Donald Trump would indeed go to Helsinki. They have a script in place. They have their talking points. Now they're going to be protesting outside the White House every night. They're going to be, as the weather gets hot, hotter, they're going to have a reason to protest around the country. Some have even called for a general strike to try to be really, you know, dramatic and all that kind of stuff. What do you mean well, a general strike? Well, in France, when they have a general strike, all the unions or many unions will go oh. out on strike, and it, it be, just to create chaos. just to create chaos. exactly. It, it's every other day, by the way. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> France is famous for labor strikes. Uh, so maybe Fabio, we won't be able to make France great again. Uh, that's a difficult uphill struggle for sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> the, the problem is not France. The problem is the French. <laughs> Make the French great again? Uh, that's, that's a long-term project. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. It's two generations of hard work on education, basically. Hmm. Yeah, same story here, actually, when it comes to education. Yes. So actually, if we go back we, to the slide, um, this, uh, he's, please don't hit the link because I'm trying to move it along. The um, Michael Cohen tapes, Trump has said, listen, you know, I'll waive executive privilege or attorney-client privilege, you can listen to whatever I said to Michael Cohen. So that created on Friday that big sensational media meltdown that got the president on tape, maybe buying off yet another person accusing him of monkey business. But uh, we're in a place now where the team has looked, th looked through it and they're not afraid uh, at all and will waive attorney-client privilege on these tapes that have been found so far. Why would he do that? To because they're, they're probably not uh, incriminating. Nothing burger. Yeah. And, and here's another question. So if you're a rich guy and you just are embarrassed by something and give someone 150 grand to shut up about it, as long as it's not illegal, is there any problem with giving somebody money to shut up? Well, I think it's like any other. Unfortunately, in this country, we have nuisance lawsuits. So there are people who make a business. I've of, heard about uh, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so a guy like Donald Trump, who at the time this happened, already had a profile of being a playboy. He'd been married how many? Three times at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, he's in the business then of the beauty pageants. You get all these people coming out of the woodwork. Right. These actresses, you know, who make you know, now claims need to be listened to, uh, particularly if they involve you know workplace harassment and stuff like that, or criminal behavior in the case of uh, Weinstein. Uh, and other people, and Clinton, Bill Clinton. But in the case of Donald Trump, what's been described so far was a consensual relationship with an adult film star that I don't know if Trump has ever admitted to it, but even if he did have that and just pay her money to not talk about it, it's really a civil matter between him and his wife. It's not criminal to pay off a prostitute to shut up. Oh, well, if she is a prostitute, then it's illegal, but she's a porn star. It's a very gray area. <laughs> That's right. The specialty of the law that I don't think I'd want to focus on. <laughs> well, that guy, Avenetti. No, I'm not a lawyer, Charles. <laughs> yeah, Avenetti is the porn star lawyer. He knows yeah. all about it, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, this is an area it's, where years ago Fabian would tell me that we Americans just were too prudish. Hmm. Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> true. So, if we hit this one though, Barack Obama was in South Africa recently, and I haven't put this up, uh, we'll talk about it briefly, but he apparently, you know, in American terms, this is an outrageous way to behave. It used to be that former presidents just go off into the sunset and shut up, and they let the next president be the president. You know, to go and travel to South, South Africa, a country that is about to melt down, and accuse Donald Trump of being a strong man while at the same time praising Nelson Mandela who, you, you know, who based his life on Che Guevara and Fidel Castro and other truly despicable human beings. When you go into Che Guevara's life and Fidel Castro's too long life, um, Justin Trudeau's father, as you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. um, but the funny thing is that we don't have this slide for you because uh, I, I hadn't had it confirmed till it, until I just got over here. Apparently, on this trip, after he went to South Africa, uh, President Obama went to Kenya and got up in front of the uh, lectern on television, in Kenya television, and said, well, I'm the first Kenyan-American president. What? And, you know, I said it to Jerry Corsi, our mutual friend. I said, is this, <laughs> is this fake news? Did he really say this? And apparently, it's true. 
That's crazy. He, he actually either was just joking, you know, or is finally admitting. I mean, it's just that's pretty. That's amazing. It is. So, um, can we can get to this? Yeah. Um, again, we don't need to put this. Uh, this link up here, but viewers should go into, if you're interested in how badly wrong Robert Mueller has gone off course, in, what, remember weeks ago the big, big thing when he needed to have an indictment to talk about, he indicted this firm Concord Management, it has nothing to do with Fabienne's foundation in France, um, that uh, apparently doesn't exist. It's kind of like the Clinton Foundation, it didn't exist. And so he's got big egg on face. This is a CNBC story, which is more reputable. Then, is it? Hmm? Yeah, it's pretty good actually. I mean, when it gets to money matters, CNBC, it's worth looking at what they have to say. They're frequently, you know, late or not wholly correct, but they're, they, they try. Anyway. It's worth looking at what they have to say so you can know who is sponsoring them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, here's something that's actually quite big. Another not-for-profit has filed a lawsuit against the Clinton uh, campaign Hmm. arguing that they broke uh, serious federal election laws uh, by failing to explain exactly who was paying for the Steele dossier and how it was used and all that. And I actually picked, I saw this story and I, I researched the foundation. I picked up uh, the, the name of somebody there. I got them on the phone, a top person. Wow. And uh, I, I hope they're going to help us, actually. I, I, I took them through some things they did not know about the Clinton Foundation and wow. about these. And uh, this is a very uh, well connected bunch of people who are, you know, law and justice types. I would describe them as well connected now that they know you. <laughs> no, <laughs> they were well connected and well before that. Um, and so we don't need to hit this one here, but we. One thing that I is actually I wonder about, you know, I, I've been more hopeful for the meeting with Putin, and uh, you know, I, it didn't go perfectly. There are rumors, actually. So there's, I got a, several emails that uh, did uh, in the soccer ball that Putin gave a chip. Of something. Is there something like a, a memories? Well, I heard that there's a chip, but I think that that is like in every FIFA regulation soccer ball so that when it's on TV they can have a line following it or something? Hmm. Well, but I heard more than that. Anyway. Data. But why would he do that? Why would he hand it to him on TV rather than just say, here, Donald Trump, here's a thumb drive in our private meeting. Because there's two interviewers, two, two translators with him. Anyway, but we did apparently confirm the U.S. is sending non-lethal aid to Ukraine. So, I mean, we're, we're far from uh, a place where all is hunky dory, though I think it is good on balance that our two presidents met. Right. If we go to that. This is, I think, the slide I was referring to. Yeah, Fabien, when I said we were going to go into detail about what you were talking about in 2008, why the Clintons and the Obamas may have gotten together, this is the slide I had in mind. Okay, because I, I can't see it. Okay, well, I'll explain it quickly. So, uh, we know, you know, that on the 31st of March, uh, 2008, eight, the largest piece of the Clinton Foundation uh, had its authority to operate in the important state of Massachusetts involuntarily revoked. So, um, you know, that's a material fact. At that time, Hillary was out with Bill campaigning around the nation saying, you know, elect us, elect me, look at all the great work Bill Clinton and I have done with this foundation. And in fact, the foundation was defunct, technically. Had they notified all the other states in the IRS that this had happened, they would have had to, they would have likely been forced to go out of business. So by the 4th of June, 2008, Barack Obama had clinched the Democratic Party nomination. The next day, he meets in Dianne Feinstein's house with Hillary Clinton, and some sort of a truce is brokered. By the 14th of July, 2008, uh, the people who were you know, never Obama-ers and always Hillary-ers in the, in the Democratic Party arranged, and it was probably Sidney Blumenthal, they arranged to get Barack and Michelle Obama pictured as Islamic terrorists inside the Oval Office on the cover of the influential New Yorker magazine. And I don't know and don't want to know anybody in the Barack Obama camp, but as a guest, without knowing any of those people, they were furious absolutely furious. You don't do that. 
you know, New Yorker magazine is incredibly influential in New York uh, and really across, across the United States. Um, so tensions flowed and rumors were in all the different political blogs and many newspapers and magazines that Hillary's supporters were irate that Barack Obama had uh, you know, usurped her natural, the natural order of things and that they were going to mount a floor fight and you know, forget what the voters said in the primaries. That seems to be the way the Clintons operate. Forget those pesky little voter things. That's been admitted to in the Beck's uh, DNC fraud lawsuit. They, in open court, have admitted that they reserve the right to select whatever candidate they want, irrespective of who gets the most votes. No, that's, that seems fair to me. <laughs> but so on the, on the unlucky August the 13th, 2008, Fabian, the chairman of the Democratic party in Arkansas was in his office in Little Rock and he was one of the people who was rumored to be trying to get this floor fight in, together which was going to happen two weeks later. Somebody walks in, shoots him three times, kills him. That person leaves and the, the state troopers got him down. So we never really know why this happened. Convenient. But that caused the fight to seep out of the Clintons. It seems like living in Arkansas is extremely bad for your health. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So then they have this, uh, um, the convention, Barack Obama is selected the 27th of August 2008. By the 15th of September 2008 or thereabouts, a lawyer, Kamiki Gibson, mm. puts together this inside report. And here I would like to just hit that link so that our viewers, particularly those of you who have not read this document before. J Jason, I have a black screen. So. Uh. Can do something about it one way or the will, other. I will try, yes. Is that better? Not yet. For the time being, I have nothing. No, it's, it's, uh, I, see, I can see myself, which is great, but not very useful. Let me, <laughs> let me try and rectify. Should I continue talking? Please. Yeah, so I, while they're trying to fix this, which we will do, I'm sure. Any better, Fabian? No, that's black again. Hmm. Now? And it's still black. Hmm. Let me call you right back and hopefully we can resolve it. Okay. We'll get that done. May I continue? Please. Yeah, so while we're getting Fabian back on in living color, um, this is a link. This particular uh, Zero Hedge story provides an actual link to the Kamiki Gibson memo in great depth. And if our viewers, if there are viewers out there who have not read the Kamiki Gibson memo, memo yet, uh, if we get a Good. chance, if we can scroll down to it. Sorry. Uh, okay. So now Fabian yeah. can see it. Good. It's at the very bottom. Um, yeah. There it is. So hmm. here, this is written November 10th, 2008. Okay. She started on it in September. September 15th, 2008. So this comes to Bruce Lindsay after Barack Obama wins the election. Mm -hmm. And this memo, it probably is not the only thing that was, was done. It focuses primarily on the um, US operations of the supposed Clinton Foundation. It doesn't get into great depth about the international operations. And this memo is, you know, it's not quite as bad as the band memo because the band memo <laughs> is it's tough to be worse than you know confessing to fraud and charity fraud. And stupid is as stupid does, Charles. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean that. Here's a guy who's now he has done so well. This Doug Band guy that he's he just bought uh, David Rockefeller's mansion for wow. twenty odd million bucks. Ah, uh, yeah. I remember you showed me that article. That's like, a lot of money. He must have inherited it because he's not making it. I mean, it, it, this the, the, anyway. Staying on Kamiki Gibson. Uh, this memo describes, uh, it should be exhibit one in an IRS complaint against the Clinton Foundation. It was sent five, actually seven days before the final filing deadline. In, in uh, 2008, I believe the final filing deadline was the 17th of November. I could have that wrong, but, and it's basically a confession of charity fraud. I know somebody else who's done that in a court <laughs> document. <laughs> <laughs> and then silence. <laughs> right. And so th this is something worth reading for those of you who have not yet read it. Mm. We go back in yeah. to the old slidos. Uh, so he wins the election on the 4th, so six days after. 
On the 16th, by the 16th of November 2008, Valerie Jarrett signs this unenforceable memorandum of understanding we've talked about in the past. Mm -hmm. um, Is that, that with the fake date or the real, the real date? That's the real date. Uh, and then on the 9th of December, this is really worth, if you can hit this one, Rod Blagojevich is arrested. That's the guy who was trying to sell the Senate seat? Well, he, that's the sitting governor of Illinois at the time. Yeah, okay. pretty crazy. And this is, is a story retroactive, you know, but, it, and it basically when you look at the actual indictment that uh, is sworn out against Blagojevich, it's an indictment alleging that a sitting politician was using, was running the Blagojevich enterprise. Does that sound familiar? The Clinton yeah. enterprise. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's basically, you can mark this um, indictment up. You hit the 16 felony counts. Quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, oh a, what's with that? That's from the Department of Justice. Hang on. That's now. interesting. Whoops. We lost it. What? Oh. oh. You go back to the slide. Yeah. Sorry about that, Charles. That's right. But anyway, she signed, uh, Blagojevich gets uh, indicted. In other words, he could sing at this point before the uh, inauguration. He could say, he could, he could reveal potentially incriminating thing. Here you go, 75 page indictment. Let's try that one. This has all been scrubbed, Charles. It worked, it worked yesterday. That's really odd. Very interesting. Well, take it from me that the indictment, which we can find other ways, let's not do it now, Jason, because I'm mindful of the sure. time. Um, the indictment could be marked up to describe the Clintons. Hmm. It's the same basic approach. Individuals, either in power or seeking power, running a corrupt enterprise for their political benefit and personal gain. And now we lost Fabian. Sorry. You know, no, we I'm have. Here. We have. So if we could you, go back to the slides, there. Um, and then on the 13th of January, Hillary, and I guess I didn't make the link work there, but Hillary testifies bef uh, before, her, before the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, and deceives the US Senate concerning the state of the Clinton Foundation. It's used extensively, her good work and Bill's good work uh, at the Clinton Foundation are used as arguments why with all this good work she's done around the world, why you could trust her to be Secretary of State. Right. So, and that's, I mean, we could go on for hours and hours and hours. These are just some of the high points of what happened. Now, then you get into this issue, um, the Clinton criminal enterprise, in my opinion, modeled on the Blagojevich matter, has much deeper Russian ties than anything connected to the, to the Trumps. I mean, she's confirmed on the 21st of January uh, 2009. A week later, Bill Clinton has an unsupervised private meeting an hour and a half with Vladimir Putin at Davos, alone. And Bill Clinton has no official title whatsoever. He's just a citizen meeting with the well, President let's, of let's, Russia. Let's compare and contrast, okay? Uh, here we have Bill Clinton's meeting with Vladimir Putin alone, seven days into the Obama administration, and the press says, hey, that's fantastic. You know, that's <laughs> and, and then Donald Trump goes and has a two-hour meeting as President of the United States, a year and, and a half into treason. his president. That's outrageous. You're rushing to meet with him? You know, you, a year and a half, and Bill Clinton's a week. It's yeah. a good point. You know, it's, it's the, the two-facedness of our press is just beyond belief, beggar's belief. Well, it's one face. It's just, as Donald Trump said, the enemy of the people. It's pushing an right. agenda of these giant corporate global billionaires. Right. And so then, then you have the reset. We don't have to hit these links. Uh, March 6, 2009, that's a joke. <laughs> then Hillary starts working on this Skolkovo matter. That's a big deal. Which Peter Schweitzer has written great stuff on that. And we, we actually need to get Peter Schweitzer on if we can. I'll try to do that. Um, then we know that Russian spies worked aggressively. They burrowed in trying to get into this porous, you know, Clinton operation where there are our, our nation's highest secrets 
you know, most secure secrets were being handled in a bathroom. Yahoo. <laughs> in, in, in a Yahoo. By Yahoo's. Yeah. Uh, using Yahoo. And then uh, th we talked about it. I mean, I forget who mentioned it. I think uh, Janine mentioned this informant, William D. Campbell. Instead of being greeted with open arms, it's, my goodness, thanks for telling you all this stuff. The FBI and Loretta Lynch land on this Campbell guy. Uh, and that's just very suspicious what they did there. We need to get to the bottom of that. By March 10th, 2009, Barack Obama is maybe feeling a little bit guilty about winning the Nobel Peace Prize for blowing <laughs> up the world. So he decides to give the, his, all of the, pe the proceeds to various charities, including 200,000 plus, to the Clinton Bush Haiti uh, fund that doesn't exist at that point. It's not lawfully organized as a charity, but he instructs a transfer of $200,000 on this March, we have, there's a link to, probably this won't work either, but let's try and hope this one works. And let's, you know, be like that. There we go. So here, March 10th, 2010, you have Barack Obama's signature on this, right? That's an interesting signature. Looks a bit like Crazy Cat. Well, it's gigantic, which I think a handwriting interpreter expert would say Barack Obama has a very inflated view of himself. Now why would you think that? <laughs> <laughs> well it's just this big showy uh, signature. But if you look at the next page. Of this document? Yes. This, oh, you know, here's the instructions up here. If we keep going, uh, let's see, further up. Thank you. Yeah, further up, stop. The Clinton Bush Haiti Fund of the Clinton Foundation. There was no such thing, right? There was no such thing as a Clinton Bush Haiti Fund of the Clinton Foundation. And if there was such a thing, its address wasn't William J. Clinton Foundation, 610 President Clinton Avenue, because that wasn't <laughs> its lawful address. It's almost like a crime perpetrated by a fifth grader. It's but, like well, <laughs> but here, Jason, here's the thing. Here you, here you have, hello, IRS, interested? Here you have the account, they call it the accounting number, it should be the account number, but somebody can get the, the uh, account information for the Nobel Prize Committee, which wired this money oh, yeah. across national boundaries to this Bank of America account, which is not the listed account for the Clinton Foundation in other filings, um, with an, it should say account number, not accounting number, Rudy Demers, Swiftco, um, you have it right there. This is an illegal transfer from Barack Obama's, from the Norwegian uh, Prize Committee to this non-existent entity. The request is made March 10th and confirmation comes in April that it happened. How did they do this? Hmm. I, now, do we even know if 200 West Capitol Avenue is an actual Bank of America, or are they doing it like they did over there on 33rd Street or 34th Street, wherever it 33rd. was? 33rd, yeah, so... It was 33rd Street, wasn't it? That's it was. interesting as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So the, the point here is that in each state, um, and, and I don't believe, I'm, I'm certain the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund had not registered in Arkansas, by it's operating out of an unregistered shed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so um, this, this is primary documentary evidence involving the signature of Barack Obama, involving you know, cross-border illegal transactions, and it's for a material amount. We have to remember that this $200,000 uh, wire transfer, Corinne Brown is in federal prison for five years over her role in an $800,000 fraud. Now, I'm not saying that for this we should go after Barack Obama, but there's no excuse, in my mind, for you know, letting this fraud off the hook any longer. It's just been, you know, it touches so many, it's, it's uh, continuous, it expands. If, as they get away with it, it only emboldens them to get bigger and bigger and more, uh, you know, more criminal, and it's got to be fully exposed now, prosecuted, and, and laid out as an example of how not to conduct charity. This is 200, uh, it could be a Bank of America in there. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to the bottom, but the point is in each state where the Clinton Foundation registers, and in Arkansas, they have to say where their account is, and I, I'm from memory, 
the Bank of America branch that they list is not the one at 200 West Capitol Avenue. Hmm. And there probably are various Bank of America branches. Looks like they've got a pool on the roof as well. Yeah. <laughs> so if we get back into it, um, he signs this uh, Obamacare legislation. Then 10 Russian spies are, are caught on the 27th of June, 2010. Okay? Mm. This is the elections. We're facing an election. On, Jan on July 7th and 8th, these spies are released. So, you mm. know, what is that? That's like less than two weeks later. Wow. It's like, see ya. You couldn't possibly have dry cleaned these spies to find out what was going on. Did that happen? Were they arrested and then booted out of the country so that these people wouldn't fess up mm. to people in the FBI who are career people in the FBI mm -hmm. Department of Justice who would have found out what about happened? the degree to, yeah, what happened. <laughs> and then this is an interesting one. Let's hope this, this one hits here. This is uh, July 1st, 2012. If, if we hit the PDF or yes. go to page two, of this by going down a bit and just hitting, yeah, page two, right there. After reviewing an email dated July 1st, 2012 with subject line forward, congratulations, Clinton stated she received no particular guidance as to how she should use the president's email address. Okay, here's, here's she's communicating with the president. Since the foregoing email was sent from Russia, Clinton stated she must have sent it from the plane. So here's Hillary Clinton communicating using her Clinton email server to Barack Obama. How do they know it was Obama. sent from Russia? Huh? How do we determine that this is sent from Russia? This is the, this is, FBI, this is the FBI summary. So you know what this says to me, Charles? Is it possible that Hillary Clinton had in place one of these uh, umbrage type situations where emails were sent in a way that appeared that they came from Russia. Maybe this is something they had planned all along. What was that? The plug from the computer came out. We good? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, this is, this to me, uh, we're talking, the point of this whole long slog and page is to say that, you know, if, if we're worried about uh, embarrassing ties between a candidate and Russia, I mean, you could, you could set up a whole new university to study the Clintons and the Podestas and everybody else over their suspicious, unexplained, long-standing ties going back to 1993, if not earlier, uh, with various interests in the former Soviet Union, now Russian Federation. I wish I had a picture of this, but in court on July 3rd, Chris Gowan was wearing an embarrassing tie. What is it? Vladimir Putin? <laughs> it was just like he got it from John Gotti or something. <laughs> Good. So if we move along. Yes. To uh, the next page. Sometimes I throw off the rhythm with a stupid joke. That's all right. That's okay. So again, we'll, we'll be selective in these links because we're trying, mindful of the time here. Um, Nancy Pelosi had. I don't want to use the phrase, let's just say the chutzpah, to suggest that as far as she's concerned, when Donald Trump brings Vladimir Putin to America, if he comes to America, that he, Putin will not be welcome in Congress because he's a thug. Now, now let's think about that. I mean, let's think about, and, and, and Chris Wallace asked the question yeah. about, you know, uh, so many of Putin's critics have ended up dead. And it's not that many, but nonetheless, It would have been funny if he shot Chris Wallace right there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it wouldn't be terribly funny well, for Chris. It wouldn't Biden. be funny, but... But, you know, on the subject of being shot, I mean, it's almost 25 years to the day of Vince Foster's death, which was January 20th, 19, yeah, July, July 20th, 20, 1993. Yeah. And um, I found in my notes uh, evidence of a meeting in early July 1993 where Hillary and Maggie Williams were conspiring with Bill Clinton to figure out how to handle the confidential presidential records that were going to be collected in the administration two weeks before, two and a half weeks before Vince Foster died. They were well mindful that there were, there's a lot of evidence going through the Clinton White House. They wanted to make sure that only the good stuff made it into the final record. And I don't think we really have had uh, credible people 
un, nonpartisan, I shouldn't say uh, bipartisan, I think nonpartisan people go back into the evidence and once and for all tell us what re to the best of their ability what was really going on, what would drive this man who by all accounts was an accomplished person, what would drive him to do whatever may have happened to him there? Was he somebody who had delved as the Clinton's personal lawyer deeply enough into the true state of their situation and decided he was not going to be the fall guy? And was he somebody who was driven to kill himself or did something worse than that happen? I think it is, it, we're still studying what happened to JFK. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more than reasonable to, for the American taxpayer, rather than studying this Russian witch hunt, mm -hmm. I'd like to see the same amount of money be spent uncovering what happened here. It's a really interesting story. Quinn Michaels and I covered it last night in a Patreon-only stream, and there's a lot of things I think that people don't know about this. There was uh, the book written by Christopher Ruddy called The Strange Death of Vince Foster. Ruddy got a former NYPD homicide detective and a retired uh, U.S. Army inspector, uh, investigator, to review the evidence, and both of those guys said that in over 30 gun-in-mouth suicides that they had investigated collectively, never once did the gun remain in the dead guy's hand because the explosive recoil of the gun, coupled with the fact that the shooter was dead, causes it to go flying, and that's just logic. Not to mention this gun was made up of parts of two different guns. Serial numbers from two separate guns were found. Carpet fibers all over his clothing. He was lying downhill, but blood, dried blood was uh, running uphill on his face and sideways. And uh, there's just so many anomalies about the death of Vince Foster that for people to simply accept the official story, not to mention his suicide was, uh, well, no, that was, that was the coroner in uh, Arkansas. The Clintons had a longstanding record of declaring suicides through this coroner, Malik who uh, one person was decapitated, they called it suicide, shot three times, suicide, yeah. karate chopped to the neck, all kinds of crazy stuff was uh, uh, determined to be suicide. They call that arcanicide, I believe. Exactly, arcanicide, correct. So if we go yes. back in, then you have the question of, you know, Ron Brown. Now I have- There's another one. Oh, well, I have a friend, an acquaintance who swears that Ron Brown w wanted to uh, tell this person exactly that he had reached the end of his rope and no longer could he be involved in this corrupt selling the Lincoln bedroom and um, selling the White House, frankly, to corporate donors and political donors. He had enough of it and he wanted to make a clean breast of it. Next thing you know, his plane goes into the side of a mountain. You know, there's an interesting thing about that as well, Charles. We did an episode on the strange death of Ron Brown, and Joe Napoli and Jack Cashel joined me. Jack has written an entire book about the matter. He's and a great guy. He is very knowledgeable. And there is a, oops, I wanted to show that, hole in the top of Ron Brown's skull. So the question is, did he die of a plane crash, or did he die of a bullet wound directly to the top of the head. Somebody wanted to make sure he was definitely, definitely dead. Not good. And then we get to the question uh, back in the slides. Uh, we've talked about this tragic figure, John Glasgow. Oh, yes. And uh, some of you may have noticed that I haven't been writing articles for Life Set, uh, in part because I wanted to really do the type of deep diving that Fabian and I both know how to do. And I can report, it's not typed up yet. There is no question in my mind that John Glasgow became aware of the financial, let's call it frauds, not irregularities, that's too nice, and was stubborn enough that he wouldn't just sign off as accountants wanted him to do on fake figures for the amount of money that would have been, in theory, sent to his employer. He wouldn't have any of it. And for that reason, he was silenced, in my view. Mm. And we'll be taking people chapter and verse through all that. John Glasgow is uh, sadly gone. His, uh, I don't know what's happened to his former wife. She's just simply moved on. I called the law firm that his brother used to work for, and they gave me his email address, and I emailed him, but he didn't write back. Yeah. So these are obviously people who either, you know, have been intimidated to the extent that they don't want to talk about this anymore or 
you know, they've been down the road of trying to expose this and they sort of suffered the consequences. Right. So if we go back into the old slide, yeah. Um, then there's a the question, let's not hit this um, link, but there's a question of what really happened at Mena, Arkansas. Oh, yeah. To those young boys who were found. Uh, I'm going to have something interesting to discuss about that pretty soon. Good. And, you know, so for, we, we don't need to hit this thing, but you, people have probably seen the Clinton body count. It's very long. It's getting longer every day. And, and so, you know, we go back to the opening question. Who's the real thug? I mean, how, how do you get off saying, well, I shouldn't talk to, to uh, you know, Vladimir Putin over here. Here's the thug. On the other hand, you know, let's, let's you know, go on the war path for a year and a half because the wife of a thug, to put it charitably, in Hillary Clinton, the wife of the thug, Bill Clinton, and maybe even the thug Hillary Clinton, you know, because I don't believe many of these things would have happened without her being intimately aware of what was going, of how the Clinton stood to benefit from all these different activities. So, you I, know. I actually was kind of sad we didn't have more time with Judge Janine because I wanted to ask her why she felt that Whoopi Goldberg wasn't in outrage over Bill Clinton based on the, you know, she thinks Donald Trump is uh, causing hatred or whatever. Bill Clinton is straight up raping people. Right. Pretty bad. Yeah, and then you go back and you look uh, in, the, in the slide there, you know, the same people who are leading this, this Me Too movement, which I think the Me Too movement is a good movement, why aren't they demanding in the Me Too movement justice for Juanita Broderick? Right. Okay, and not just criticizing Bill for this. It's bad enough what Bill did, but Hillary had to at least have a sense that this was going on. And she, you know, she ruined Juanita Broderick, the two yeah. of them. Yeah, I think by all accounts, she knew full well what was going on. Yeah. And so you, you're going to make a big to-do about Vladimir Putin, but you're going to spend a billion dollars trying to get Hillary Clinton to be in the White House for another eight years and further destroy the country. Then you get, you know, in terms of thuggish behavior, you have what's going on in China in numerous hot spots. Uh, this is an interesting zero hedge piece, which we might want to hit up. And that, that basically is just up this morning, and it talks about how, well, I hadn't been appreciating that Montenegro went heavily into debt building a long road from one portion to the coast, and they can't pay for it, and they're, the people they owe the money to are China. So China oh. is trying to pick different small nations that they can get inside in Europe. Huh. Now Rwanda in Africa, they're doing the same thing. Wherever they see, you know. It's so like a mobster tactic. Yeah, hey, exactly. You like that road? <laughs> you like those kneecaps? Right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, what, I bring this up just because Montenegro is the subject of discussion out of the NATO meeting. Oh, all right. Uh, well, so that's an interesting strategic way to squeeze them, isn't it? Yeah. And then we don't need to bring uh, more info up on George Soros, but he really needs to be brought to justice. He should not be spending the last moments of his life savoring, you know, the, the ill-gotten gains that he's amassed over the years, really ruining country after country, person after person, taxpayer after taxpayer, while becoming a mega billionaire. I mean, that is just not a, a track record that should go unchallenged. Funding funding the likes of David Brock and all that kind of stuff. Really so bad. If we go into the next page, and this is, yeah, this is the final page, Fabian. I can see that your, your eyes are slipping a little bit here. <laughs> no, no, not really. No, actually, I'm in pretty good shape. I can go on for another two hours. If you well, we won't be doing that. <laughs> that's, that's the bad news. That's the bad news. <laughs> but, but this is an important one. And if you pull it up on your presentation, I hadn't appreciated that, the, I mean, I knew the 14th Amendment came into place after the Civil War, but the date was July 9th, 1868. So importantly, in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, it says, basically, no person shall be deprived of equal protection of the laws. Okay? That's an important principle that every American, doesn't matter what your political persuasion is, we are entitled to equal protection of the laws. So, Paul Manafort stands accused of tax matters in 2004, 2005. Paul Manafort, his home was raided. He was put in prison in protective, you know, in, in, 
in prison. Solitary confinement. So, in solitary confinement. The weekend before Father's Day. He's still in prison. His trial begins this week. Okay, now I don't know the particulars of what Manafort may or may not have done. The unifying uh, argument against him is that he failed, to, he was a, acting as a foreign agent, and that he failed to register on the Foreign Agents and Registration Act of 1938. Very few people have been prosecuted for that, but this guy is being prosecuted aggressively because the theory is that, I would guess, that Mueller's theory is by prosecuting Manafort, you eventually turn and get people, maybe even Trump himself. Well, I think it's sending a message to anybody that's had anything to do with Trump that if you don't cooperate, they're going to make your life miserable, isn't it? So that's on the one hand. Then on the other hand, you have Hillary Clinton under Obama. You know, she, the, the evidence that she bleach bit and the devices that she destroyed were under subpoena. It wasn't like, you know, she did it, be, they, were, they had been subpoenaed and she destroyed all the stuff. She had been mishandling classified information. They never convened a grand jury against her. They never got search warrants to go through stuff. They gave immunity to key co-conspirators who were allowed in the room when she was questioned. I mean, you go on and on. The contrast between those two things is so stark. Now, I know, Charles, you frequently reminded us that you're not a lawyer, but I think this is a pretty general question. Even if she had done nothing wrong, if you get a subpoena from Congress and then crush the computer, that's a crime. Destruction yep. of evidence, spoliation of evidence. Right. Right, and, and you know, it, it's all, she's the one who coined famously when she was under attack, she's the one who, who uh, coined the phrase vast right-wing conspiracy. This yeah. is a fight, vast lunatic conspiracy. It's not, <laughs> it's not right-wing or left. These are a bunch of stark, raving, mad lunatics and soci sociopaths. Yeah. So um, this so idea we, we don't thank, need to hit. Yeah, we can thank Mr. V in his lap stock. Sorry? We can thank Mr. Wiener for his laptop. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> right. Assuming the FBI gets to the bottom of it. Yeah, I agree. Then, uh, so this rumor that Tony Podesta and maybe others are being given immunity is really already exciting the, other, the right wing. I wish we could have had the judge answer her professional opinion about that. Why haven't we heard something official, like on Pacer, or I guess it wouldn't be on Pacer, but when, where would we see some kind of official announcement of that? Well, as I understand it, um, he sought permission, uh, that is say Mueller sought position for this, uh, uh, permission for this, but he doesn't want to telegraph what he's up to, so you, you're probably not going to find out about what really happened here until a trial, if there is wow. a trial. But you know, that just kind of reeks of the same type of playbook as what happened to Imran Awan. They set up these arrests for stupid crimes that make no sense so they can give the person yeah. immunity for pleading to that crime and then solve some other problem. Once it's officially on the books, that's it. Yep, I totally agree. Now, we, again, we don't need to hit this link either that John Brennan, you know, at this stage, there's no question in my mind that John Brennan is a criminal. I mean, he is corrupt. He's been engaged in trees. He's put himself way above the law. He decided that Donald Trump shouldn't be president. He got together with, you know, willing co-conspirators and said, you know, we're going to make this happen. We'll cook up this, you know, I've got people. We'll cook up uh, the evidence we need. Donald Trump's never going to be president. I got this for you, Barack. Don't worry. That's probably what happened in part. And he can't hide behind sources and methods. He can't hide behind, you know, a sterling career. He's not, he wasn't a CIA director supposed to be political at the time. Now, George Bush was also a CIA director and eventually became quickly thereafter political. But not a, not a good person to compare. Him to. Right. Well, it's time to reform the CIA. <laughs> or it's time to reform it. Past get time rid to of reform it. Yeah. So then, you know, this whole issue of, you know, Russia, 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 let's be so concerned about Russia. We're going to go and do another program, many other programs, hopefully, Fabian, talking about the perils posed by China. I mean, if you were to contrast the two, you have 140 million people or so in, in Russia, you got 1.3 billion in China. You have China aggressively, more aggressively than Russia, building out its military ca capabilities, building out more ships and fighters, and they obviously have the capacity to create a gigantic army if they want to. You know, I would have thought that if we're gonna, if we, if we could only have one bogeyman country, 
you know, with what we see today, it's China, it's not Russia. And in America, in France, in Europe, uh, the, the globalists are enthralled to China. The think tanks, the multinational corporations, everybody in theory wants a piece of the big internal Chinese market that I think is a myth. There's not a big uh, Chinese market, frankly, yet, because the economy hasn't grown enough. But instead of spending all this time on mainstream media pounding the table at China, Russia, 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 let's have some balance. Let's have you know, a real fair discussion. Who are our friends? Who are our enemies? And does Russia have more to worry about with China than it might have to worry about with the United States? Yeah. I would argue it's a little bit closer to China. It's got a vast territory out there that's rich in resources, right adjacent to China, bordering China. It'd be pretty easy for a Chinese army to just go into Russia, as happened in the, in the 60s. China and, and the Soviet Union had a skirmish hmm. for a period of time. I, you know, so Why is it a bogeyman and not a boogeyman? Well, I just, I, <laughs> I was trying to be. So Gosh, here's something, Fabi, I don't know if you knew this. I didn't know this until I checked it. I think you could crush, Trump can crush the resistance uh, focusing on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Read the stuff in red. No person shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. So what this idiot Alexandria, whatever her name is, and Bernie Sanders and these peop the people in the resistance who are trying to burn you know, the Constitution up and shut down ICE and open up our borders, why isn't that an insurrection or rebellion? Mm. I mean, this is, a, you know, in the Trump case, he's not talking about with his rallies, he's not talking about shredding the Constitution, tearing the United States. No, he's saying, you know, Make his followers are saying, let's, let's enforce and honor the Constitution. Yeah. The resistance, on the other hand, is saying, we didn't get the vote we wanted in 2016. And they, there are many, many, Maxine Waters has called yeah. Oh, yeah. For what I would argue is an insurrection or rebellion against the United States, against the Trump administration. Well, she said that, you know, if you see people at the gas station or the restaurant or the shopping mall, that you should tell them they're not welcome there. So she wants to deny people their constitutional rights to move around freely. And just because someone likes Donald Trump or doesn't like Donald Trump, they still should be able to go to a restaurant or a shopping mall or a gas station. Right. Well, and also I think, particularly under the Clintons and under Obama, uh, the mainstream press was, and the academics were lazy enough to believe that presidential elections are elections where the winner can decide whether or not to respect the Constitution. I mean, that, that's just not the way it works. I mean, you're supposed <laughs> to respect the Constitution whichever party you're in. That's right. you're, you're faithful to uphold the laws. Of the, and these people are trying to shred the Constitution. So uh, with that, I think you know, it's way past time to investigate these investigators on the left these are Mueller, Rosenstein, the FBI chief, Ray, Senator Warren, Warner, Durbin, Congressman oh, well, Adams. Charles, what did you think about Ray saying he was going to resign if Donald Trump got Russia involved with the investigation? <laughs> Don't let the door hit your back on the way out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's good news. Schiff, Blumenthal, Pelosi. Hang on. Yes, Faye Sorry, I, I just had one, one, one or two comments. Yes. First, I come from a family of true resistance against the Nazis. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I find utterly disgusting that the Clintons and their clans use the term resistance. Okay? It's, they should be ashamed of using it in this context. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay? And my father is still alive. He's 98. Okay? And he was a resistant at the age of 23 in the French forest fighting the Nazis and the German division, Das Reich. Okay, so he's it's, it's no slouch, and we have a tradition in our family to resist when issues of principles are important. Okay? This is his gangsterism, mafia type. Second comment I would like to, to, to add is that the left, leftists and the liberals on both sides of the Atlantic, have a specialty which, using a chess term called roke, they roke the meanings of words. In other terms, they exchange. The oh no! So that 
they we lost you for the, a second there. There, uh, there, I mean, sorry, hello? We, we lost you for a moment. They, they changed the meanings of the words, and then we lost you for a second. They yeah, they, they changed the meanings of the words and used words into a context uh, which should not be used, thinking that people have forgotten. Well, Europe, people have forgotten about Nazism and resistance. Okay? And I've been tweeting on that on various occasions, and I found this utterly disgusting. Sorry, yeah, I, I agree with you, Fabien. It is disgusting. Indeed. Sorry. That's Indeed. quite all right. That's so a very we're, good point. We're, we're at the close of the presentation. You know, I, as I said with Judge Jeanine, uh, it is time for Donald Trump. He doesn't have the excuse at this point of saying, well, you know, I'm not the President of the United States yet. I mean, he's the President of the United States. I think we've seen that this Mueller thing is a witch hunt. We've seen that the Clinton team, the Soros-backed Obama team, is prepared to do anything, including subvert the Constitution. You know, I would argue, I'm not arguing for, you know, any type of physical violence or anything at all like that, but I am saying that, you know, we need to bring this system back to equal justice under the law uh, as Janine Pirro administered when she was in her various roles. That needs to be something you can count on inside America. Donald Trump can go a long way to getting us back to that by exposing fully the gigantic criminal enterprise which is, you know, is the Clinton Foundation and now this Obama Foundation, which is trying to emulate the Clinton Foundation. It would seem to me that there's a straightforward way in 2018 to say, look, you know, on the subject of presidential libraries and presidential records, you know, we need to update that whole approach. We need to decide what are presidential records in the electronic age and what are presidential records, how a president can monetize his or her service, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, um, how do you control these things? How do you punish? And how do you make sure that a rogue foundation doesn't just get to be used as a slush fund forever? And, you know, my patients, I have a lot of patients. Donald Trump's got a lot of things going on. But, you know, I'm prepared to do this daily, if need be, to, you know, to make sure that the people who can do something about this in this country, in the United States, at state level, the people running for office, they get the job done before or shortly after this election so that our foreign partners, the French, the UK, and other governments can follow our league, make an example of this mess, hold people responsible, get money back, and, and get back to a fair course where you know, all Americans flourish under law. I'd certainly like to see that, Charles. I've been uh, very frustrated as well. I think that Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions could do some things that they aren't doing. The Imran Awan thing was outrageous. If this is true about Tony Podesta, that's outrageous. Paul Manafort being stuck in solitary confinement, outrageous. It's all nuts. But uh, that was quite a comprehensive presentation. I really appreciate it. And that was great having Fabian and Judge Janine. It's always a pleasure to have you on, Fabian. Thank you, man. It's also my pleasure. Thank you for staying awake well, with us over there. Uh, and it's, uh, it's much better than Japan than from Japan. From the, the time <laughs> difference, yes, yes. Uh, and now those those glasses of, of yours look very interesting to our viewers. You kind of look like you're a member of the Blues Brothers. Because <laughs> they were reflect. <laughs> you know, I think some of the well, video the, problems the we I think some of the video problems we are having, Fabian are caused by this chandelier behind you backlighting you. <laughs> when your head moves and the light is shown yes. to the camera, it's changing the aperture on the camera, which changes oh. all the pixels in the frame and stymies the video compression that's being used to transmit you oh. from France well, to I here. There's all these details right. you oh. have to consider. Uh, yeah, uh, Charles, sorry, you, do you allow me just to uh, do a small update of what I've done over the past few months you asked me that? Please, please, that'd be great. We've lost you, Fabian. We were just about to get the you update. Me? Yeah, there we go. Yes. yes. Okay. So first, a year ago, I've contacted uh, the French uh, National Financial Prosecutor. He has a file, and he has a lot of information. Second, uh, recently, I contacted the main 
uh, daily and weekly newspapers, there are about 10 of them, who are their chief editors, some of them I know personally. They all have a file on the Clinton Foundation. Third, uh, the senior member of the French Parliament, who is, a, uh, who is a member of the Finance Commission of the French Parliament, uh, which is the equivalent in the US of your House and Means Committee, so it's an important committee, um, was contacted by me. And he wrote me that he was going to write what we call on the French uh, legal system uh, for the French Parliament, a written question to the French government. And that is a, a very formal and important way uh, used by a French Parliament member to actually put to the public not only his question, but also the response of the government, which the government has to do. So I'm awaiting this to happen in the next few weeks. This person actually is not only a friend of mine, but also a senior former member of the Cour des Comptes, uh, the same Cour des Comptes who has undertaken this report on the Unitail and the French and the Clinton Foundation in 2010. And he was a member of the uh, Finance Committee who undertook the hearings, uh, public hearings, of the Unitail personnel and of the senior members of the French administration in charge We lost you there, Fabian. Can you hear me? Yeah. Anyway, so basically the groundwork has been laid uh, and nobody in France, whether it's, it's whether in the news and to some extent we have the same issue with fake news in France than in the US. Nobody in the fake news in France, nor at the, in the parliament, nor uh, the government uh, would be in a position to say that they are not aware. We are yeah. losing Fabian as he's delivering. As you're yeah. delivering your most Sorry? important information, your, your Skype call is, is being intermittently slowed down for some reason. Yeah, because I, maybe it's my, uh, my system. Uh, yeah. when, when was it slowed down? Uh, so, 20 seconds ago. Yeah. See, when I was talking about, uh, so, so I, I was saying that basically nobody in France can say they're not aware of the Clinton Foundation issues as raised by Charles and by myself in relation to Unitaid, whether it is the French financial national prosecutor, the uh, French parliament, the French government shortly, or the media, and when I say media, the fake medias in France. Right. Fabien, okay. what, if anything, has happened with the arrest of Nicolas Sarkozy? Uh, well, he, He's been indicted on many, on various fronts at the same time. So I say indicted. So unless you're proven guilty, uh, being indicted means uh, you have to show up at a trial. So you know, I just want to be fair with the process. Uh, but you know, he, he's, uh, he's, you know, I, I just can't say what's going to happen during a trial, yeah. because uh, there have been an, at least four different subjects. One is one of them is one of our favorites subject between Charles and I, which is Libya, what really happened in Libya in 2011-2012. Uh, bear in mind that the rumor is, and there is some evidence, and there was even some interviews of Libyan witnesses on French television that uh, Mr. Sarkozy's campaign uh, in 2007 was financed by Libya, okay. uh, with a very large number of euros attached to it. Um, there has been some written evidence, some of them being, uh, uh, you know, accused of being actually uh, falsified documents. So, personally, I don't have, have any uh, evidence 
uh, which can tell me that that has been the case or not. But you know, there's a lot of crude. But do we know when he is expected to go to trial? Uh, not yet. I don't think it's yet scheduled because I, because the investigations by the investigative judges are still going on. Okay. Uh, there was another issue with uh, trying to influence a member of the French Supreme Court to uh, uh, divulge uh, highly confidential information uh, in relation to uh, one trial uh, and uh, with a sort of kind of payoff uh, exchange or payoff uh, with the promise to have this guy appointed at the senior. Carry on. Hmm. I don't know. Sometimes it's Skype is. There you go. There you go. You're back. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. yeah no, so, 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 you know, uh, I think uh, we have to wait until this is actually judged. It can take another five years because you have, you know, first level, uh, first circuit, and then you have the appeal. And in most cases, in case, cases like that, the Supreme Court. Uh, and then it goes back to. Uh, uh, another another appeal, so it's a, it's a ten year process basically. Whoa. With, with the usual speed of French justice, which is pretty close to a snail. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an escargot? You beat me to the punch, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> and that was such a good joke, it froze but, Fabian in his very, tracks. Yes. But, but they can be very precise. They can be very precise too. Mm. So it froze again. Just a, just yeah. for a moment, after Charles was talking about escargot, right? So, um, in essence, we have to wait, and um, I can't say more because I don't. I never had access to the files. Good, but there there, there is there is a lot of evidence that's that, that way. But is that evidence sufficient to uh, to lead to a conviction? I don't know. Thank you very much, Fabien. You've been so generous with your time uh, and all your help. Uh, I hope you leave for vacation tomorrow morning. No, no I leave actually on uh, uh, on Thursday morning. Oh, so, okay. So yes, so um, I'll be still on on emails for the next two days with you, Charles. Unfortunately for you. No, no, I welcome. <laughs> I look well, it was to certainly it. a pleasure having you on the show today. There's a ton of valuable information here. Charles, thank you for joining me as always. And we'll be back on Wednesday to continue closing in. Undoubtedly, there will be uh, a ton of uh, crazy things going on this week. It's been uh, one of the most unbelievable periods in history as far as the people's heads exploding about Donald Trump. And uh, I want to remind everybody who's watching that Crowdsource the Truth is sponsored by you. Couldn't do this work with some giant corporate sponsor because they're all in the pocket of the Clintons. <laughs> so if people are watching the show and enjoying it, I hope they'll go to patreon.com slash crowdsource the truth and become sponsors of the program. They can make a one-time sponsorship payment by going to paypal.me slash crowdsource the truth. However, if you become a monthly sponsor, you're going to get access to exclusive content. So far, Quinn Michaels and I have done, I believe, three broadcasts that have been Patreon only, and I'm getting contacted by people who everyone in the crowdsource community knows who are interested in doing that, supplementing the free content that we create with exclusive content for the patrons of the show. And it's a balance that I'm trying to find. I think the people that are paying to sponsor this work deserve something extra. But of course, we want the message to go out as far and wide as it can and we're sensitive to the fact that not everyone has a lot of money so even one dollar a month five dollars a month I think if people have one less coca-cola one less light beer one less cigarette they could decide to sponsor the show and get access to that great material Fabian we'll see you again soon certainly enjoy your holiday there in Paris it must be beautiful this time of the summer it's a bit hot uh and the Skype is kind of slow. <laughs> but other than that, it's beautiful. I always love cool. Paris. Merci beaucoup, Fabian. We'll see you soon, OK? So, Au revoir. And, OK, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank me. you, Sorry, Fabian. It broke, it broke down again. So I just it's OK. Sure totally OK. My thanks, many thanks. Ne marche pas.
Thank you. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.